Hello again, friends, and you are our friends, and welcome back to another edition of Jim Cornette's drive Through right here on another winter's day, the end of January, or maybe the beginning of February when you hear this. You can listen to it anytime, wherever you want. I'm your host, the great Brian Last. We have so much to talk about, and here he is, the star of the show, to do all the talking, Mr. Hey. Jim Cornette. Oh, for heaven's sake, all the talking. No, 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 you're going to jump in on this. I don't even know where we are in the space-time continuum. You said uh, we're back again with another drive through but we're actually doing the... Because of the breaking news of the fact that the evil Dr. Miguelito Loveless got $5 billion from... I'm sorry, I'm. that's the WWE got $5 billion. Uh, we've already done some of that as, as a breaking news YouTube clip, which is going to go in this program here in a little while, or maybe at some point. And we've done that, but now we're doing the start of the program after we've done the middle of the program or possibly the end of the program. We don't know what part of the program it might be. Maybe you do. I don't. So have I been well, clear enough about this? I'm not exactly sure. Well, we have some news from the future. Although technically it took place in the past, Kevin Patrick has now been fired by WWE. Oh, well, well you'll hear about us speculating on that later on. But uh, We traveled to the future to talk about it, but we're now, well, I guess technically we're past that point here, but we're going to go back into the past shortly. Uh, welcome back, my friends, to the show that never ends. We're so glad you could attend. Please come inside. Come inside. So poor old Kevin is going to have to go back to his, you know, former occupation as, I uh, guess, an inhalation therapist crash test uh, dummy. Sniffing panties. <gasps> oh, come on. Uh, now, that was never proven. You know, I had an old adage proven to me the other day, an old saying, as you will. What's that? Actually, it wasn't even the other day. It was yesterday. Good God. Um, Night before last, I'm sitting in the TV room. I'm autographing merchandise for the fine customers at Cornette's Collectibles, and Stace comes in and says, what is that noise coming from the garage? And she was in the back room and I heard it through the wall. And I open a door and go out there, and it sounds like a single-engine airplane is taking off in my garage. And it's coming from the row of closets that houses the the water heater and the water softener and the furnace and all that stuff, and I've told you I've been on a mission for the last couple of years of replacing everything in the house that might need replaced over the next 20 years, so I don't have to worry about it. And one of those, the furnace is only a year old, and I get my ear up to, it's fucking, Wah. I don't know what the fuck's gonna, so the first thing that, uh, yesterday morning, I call him and I say, hey, my furnace sounds like it's going to blow up. You got to come over here. This could be a big... They just had a house blow up over in southern Indiana. Some, no, or was it Shepherds? I can't remember. Somewhere away from me, about 25 or 30 miles. And the goddamn house blew up, and it took them a couple of days to find the guy that was inside of it. And I don't want this to become a trend. So they, they come out a couple hours later, and I've got the closet door open. And the guy gets out of his truck and he walks in immediately and you hear them, wah. Anytime the heat goes on, wah. And I said, what's going on here? He said, I know what that is. And Brian, guess what he got out of his truck? A limb lopper? A roll of duct tape. Because like the old saying goes, you can fix anything with a roll of duct tape. Well, this must be where it came from, because apparently, and he showed me this, and it worked, because of all the wet weather, it's just, it's so incessantly raining and cold, and now the fog is so fucking thick in the middle of the day here, you can't see shit. The duct tape around the, where the air sucks in through the, the blower thing there, and it's, 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 it's airflow is what it is. And the fucking duct tape worked its way off the side of the thing to the point where the air was being sucked through there and creating that noise like a giant tuba. 
And he takes a strip of duct tape and he takes this little plastic thing. He said they should have squeegeed it. And he squeegees the duct tape. And it's fucking, it's, you can hear a mouse pissing on cotton now. Fixed a whole goddamn deal. Is that amazing or what? Country life. <laughs> you should have said or what? Or what? Anyway, so we got to get into this program, but I would be remiss if I didn't remind everybody that uh, I know it's your show, but that you can go now immediately. Don't even listen to Brian's next statement to jimcornet.com and you can see all the information as well as copious amounts of pictures of the brand new Midnight Express and Heavenly Bodies tag team action figure sets that are going on sale at Jim Cornette, only at jimcornet.com, exclusively, nowhere else in the world can you get these, February 10th at noon Eastern. You can see the, uh, the uh, information on the different packages. Some of them come with books as well as the autographed photo and the tag team set in the display box. There is a limited number again of sets with Bobby Eaton's autograph on the photos. And as I mentioned this past weekend, none of these are going to be remade or others produced in the future because I've, I'm not a, a big-time gambler. And Brian, I think I mentioned that I'm 62. I'll be 63 this year. I've decided to stop putting up large amounts of money in advance for shit that I can't sell for two or three years because mathematically, one of these days, I'm going to lose that gamble. And you never know. But right now, while I'm still around and they're still available because there's less than a thousand of the Eaton and Condry sets, less than a thousand of the Eaton and Lane sets, and 500 of the Heavenly Bodies, Dr. Tom Pritchard and Sweet Stan Lane, all of them, as I said, come with autographed photos, some of them with other items as well, and you can look that up at jimcornett.com and... All of the other merchandise that we sell, the Cornette face shirts, the cult Cornette certificates, all of the regular merchandise, just like when we launched the action figure four packs, that's going to come down so that we can service the customers in a timely fashion on these tag team sets, because it's still just me and the feather bottoms. So if you don't want a tag team set, but you want anything else that we sell, Order it before February 10th because that stuff will be down until we fulfill the orders for the tag team packages, make everybody happy. That's what I got. Yes, you do. And that's what everyone will have. Everyone's excited about these tag yes, team sets. I, I've got something and I'm going to spread it around and give it to everybody I come in contact with. You never thought about with the Heavenly Bodies getting any kind of matching jacket, I guess? Do what now? A matching jacket with their robes. Tom had the jacket uh, standing. Oh, you the robe. mean for me? For you? No, I never. I did go ahead and and get a set of Heavenly Bodies trunks with the comet on the ass, and 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 when we had six man tag team matches, I I did wear those along with my regular, you know, red Michelin man bodysuit and copious amounts of pads on every part of my body. I went that far, but I, I, I did, you know, I didn't get a Heavenly Bodies jacket. How disappointed were you with the WWE Heavenly Bodies costume redo? And what oh, was, good what Lord. What was it, 94? 95, I guess, right? Well, the jackets and or robes that they made, and this was for Tom and, and Jimmy, Stan, at least by that point, did not suffer the indignity. He would have thrown them down. Of the angel wings... But like I said, the robes and the jackets weren't bad. They were nicely made, nicely done. But the first fucking, when they had the angel wings, which what, did those last for like three or four weeks? I don't know how many episodes of television. But they, not only was it goofy, but they were so cheap when you looked at them in person. It was like, fuck, it was like a kid's Halloween costume with angel wings coming out. And, Creative Services says, and why don't you flap your arms when you come out? Oh, my God. <laughs> so it looks like, you know, you're floating down. I said, if either one of you motherfuckers flaps your arms when I'm coming to the ring, you'll look around and not see me there. I'm not <laughs> fla flapping my arms to the fucking ring. 
And I went and, and I said, th- that's why they finally took the goddamn wings off. Cause I went to Bruce. I went to several people. I can't remember who all. I said, look at this shit. This is ridiculous. Fucking white feathered angel wings. How does it get there though? I mean, you say creative services did it. Did Vince say, give them wings. Did someone show him the wings and he said, I like it. Did it, it yeah, well, was no, he not involved at all? And it just got on TV. He, um, if it was a creative services thing, because see, for their first year in, in the WWF, that's why he said the 94 makeover, they were still working Smoky Mountain and we were doing TVs and the pay-per-views. And then when they went full time, they wanted to make, give them new outfits, right? And again, uh, no problem with that. Just not with the fucking goofy fucking wings. And what would happen in a situation like that is creative services would send shit to Vince and depending on what day of the week it was, I mean, if it had been Thursday instead of Tuesday or whatever, he may have liked fucking Chili McFreeze for Steve Austin. And and they would, but they would send over ideas like that because they weren't the wrestling people. They were, they were supposedly creative services people who would get the basic idea of, well, we're bringing this wrestler in and he's a plumber. And they'd go from there. And 95 per 99% of it would get wadded up and tossed. They'd fax the stuff in the, in the era of that, or they'd send it over in an envelope. And Vince would look at it with me or Bruce or Bruce and Pat, whoever may have been at the time. And, and something might catch his attention. All he wanted was uh, sort of like with shit stain. He just wanted a million ideas and he'd sit there and stare at one or two and huff at most of them. And, you know, and, and then he would think of something, but you know, on occasions, oh, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. They got heavenly butters. They got the wings. Yeah, good. Moving on. Cause it wasn't like he was reviewing a Steve Austin makeover when talking about getting the heavenly bodies, new gear. Right. So it wasn't, he wasn't going to fucking lose sleep over that. But that's how that would happen with anybody, with any gimmick. Did Bruce ever speak up and disagree with Vince or tell him that one of his ideas maybe wasn't up to snuff? In, in the, he could, Bruce had got to the point where he could either do it in the most diplomatic way possible, or he could go so over the top with making a joke out of it and laugh at the same time that it cushioned the idea that he was disagreeing with or uh, being impertinent or taking the piss out of one of Vince's ideas. And once if he could get him to laugh, then he could maybe suggest something else. If he didn't laugh, then maybe he backed up and didn't worry too much about pressure or whatever. Right. But there was no, there was no spirited philosophical discussions. It was just, it was, he was applying Vince's, view of wrestling but maybe with a different fucking idea of what might be done with a person well that was how the bodies got their wings and uh we know what happened when the wings got clipped yeah every every time (laughs) a fucking the bell rang the bodies went out there and and the wings were starting to molt also the wings were starting to to fall apart anyway by the time we said yeah just okay just clip them off and they kept the jackets and shit who were they working with? Were they working with the Bushwhackers? Or was it the Smoking Go? Who were they working with on the road when they first went up there? Oh, God. I, I don't know. I wasn't with you them. You didn't go? Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, because that, it was on the road. I couldn't. I didn't have time. I wasn't even there. But that was the, you know, their best year was the year, their best year in the ring and for being used was the year that they were just doing the part-time stuff and working for me in Smoky Mountain because we got a match with the Steiners because they were short on tag teams, which is why that they probably, you know, had the idea to begin with. And, and the, you know, they could tear the house down with the Steiners because the Steiners were used to working with my teams and the style we did, and they liked the guys, and Tom and, and Jimmy were great. And then... You know, we, they were featured somewhat just because it was a part-time thing. And I've said this before, but if, anytime you work for Vince in any capacity, if you're a visitor 
or someone with something else going on and you're stopping in, you get treated great, like a, you know, a house guest that doesn't stay too long. But when you move in and you're living in the spare room, he treats you like a fucking field hand. Did creative but, services ever hand you anything? Like, this is the way we envision Jim Cornette looking? No. No. Um, I'll, I'll say, well, I'll, I'll address that, but I'll say one more thing about that's why when the bodies went up there full time, they were working in the middle and they weren't in the ta tag team title picture at all. And, you know, because it was now they're there, but the, the only time that anybody ever see, I think I've told this story, but it's been years. Our friend, Kevin Dunn, um, Jennifer Good, who was one of the producers there, had been there for ages and worked with us when we did voiceovers, the announcers and everything. A great, great young lady. She came to me one time, had a box, and she said, here, this is from Kevin Dunn. I saw, <laughs> At first, I wanted to dip it in water, right, or see if it was ticking. But I opened the top of it. It was a couple of those nice collared shirts in red and black with the WWF logo when they got the scratchy thing and they got the, you know, the attitude or whatever the fuck. I was, well, thank you. I guess, it, you know, I thought it was presents for all of the announcers or the TV staff or whatever. I said, well, thank him. I appreciate it. She said, no, he wants you to wear these on the air. I said, Okay. I said, well, you won't be able to really see the logo. I got my jacket on or whatever. And she said, well, no, she wanted me to just like Kevin Kelly and Michael Cole and the announcers at that time were just wearing the open collared WWF shirts. So what well, she didn't want, but basically he was saying, just dress like the rest of the announcers. And I said, well, is, is Lawler going to do that? Well, I don't think so. I said, well, tell Kevin, I appreciate these shirts and I still have them to this day in my office here. And I said, I'll, st <laughs> I'll start wearing them when the King does. Cause it, it, that ain't my gimmick to look like Michael Cole and Kevin Kelly. I'm wearing the tie. I'm wearing the fucking jacket. And I, you know, I'm using the tennis racket even in sometimes when I'm interfering or whatever the fuck, even as an announcer. So I'd look kind of stupid sitting out there looking like Mo, Larry and Curly with Michael Cole and Kevin Kelly, but I'm the one carrying a tennis racket. What if they gave you a microphone shaped like a tennis racket? Well, now that might be different, but no, here was the thing because this was at a point where I was doing more announcing and wasn't managing. I would bop back in every now and then as, as we know. And I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have minded transitioning to announcing at that point and doing that, but I wasn't going to have Kevin Dunn give one of the, have one of the producers give me a goddamn box of shit and just say, well, here, don't do the gimmick you've been doing in some form or fashion for the past 15 years. If Vince had come and said, well, Corny, why don't you dress up and be an announcer and do that type of thing? Okay. Then you've asked me and I've agreed to it. But be handed a box of fucking monogram shirts? Fuck you, you fucking buck tooth son of a bitch. I will not change my gimmick on a secondhand message from you. And so then, what, a year and a half later, or whenever it was, when I started doing the commentary and was the matchmaker for the public consumption in OVW, I wore fucking matching shit because I'm an executive now. I didn't do the goddamn pink pants and the whatever the fuck. But that's because I was changing my presentation. I wasn't going to change my fucking presentation to the world on worldwide television for fucking a spot that I was having that was changing on a regular basis. And when the fucking head of the company had not even asked me to do it. Do you think if you hadn't gone back to Louisville, if you had been able to just live within that system as awful as it was a little bit longer or a few years longer, you think that would have been your future role there transitioning into full-time commentary? Jim Hurd's uh, dream. <laughs> Um, it, all things having worked out that probably yes, but at the same time, I think if I'd have stayed there a few more years, I would have transitioned full time into prison. All right. Well, there's no transition from that. So why not time travel? Uh-oh, hold on. Have... Let me get the seatbelt. Buckle up. You got the helmet? Uh, 
I get. Hold on. Stan's helmet. Yeah. Oh no. Hold your hair. No, in place. actually, a, a possum. <laughs> a possum mistook that hair helmet for another possum and fucked it to death many years ago. You think he would ever do a personal appearance wearing? Because everyone knows what he looks like now, so he can't. You know, everyone knows that it's not a real thing. But if he wore like Stan Lane, a Stan Lane wig, would he do it? You think? No. <laughs> No, I'm pretty sure he wouldn't do it, but in the tag I'm sure Steve team, would do it. Steve would do it. But in the in, in the tag team set of the Heavenly Bodies that's going on sale, the the picture that comes autographed with it, and also the picture on the beautifully illustrated display box does have Stan wearing the pelt on his head. It's it's right in that era. It didn't last long, but it's there. It captured for posterity. What's more of a collectible than that? But ladies and gentlemen, we will now travel to the future and then we will return here to the past. Let's go to the future. We are here in the future. As you may have been able to tell, Great Brian Last and Jim Cornette here on the drive through my show. So we've got big yeah, things to talk I ain't, about. Yeah, I ain't taking credit for this one. That sounded like Minnie Mouse being anally protruded on a calliope. On a calliope? Well, hold on. I could... I can see where no, I can see what that, you're saying. I can see what you're that's, saying. That's 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 Mickey getting a delivery down to Hershey Highway from a trucker at a rest stop. Hey, what do you think about the fact that, like, Steamboat Willie, the first Mickey Mouse sound cartoon, the one that really made Disney a star, you know, himself and then his uh, company, it's now public domain. Disney no longer has exclusive rights to it. They could do whatever they want with it, but other yep. people can as well. What do you think? What is it, 95 years, 96 years? 95, what is the I think. Cut yeah. Off point? yeah, well, there you see. And now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, JimCornette.com, you're going to have a complete line of Steamboat Willie action figures, uh, DVDs, books, and autographed pictures. We actually... Steamboat Corny. Well, we dug Walt up, went down there and, and jackhammered under the concrete down there in, in uh, Disneyland, and an or Disney myth. World, rather. That's an urban myth. And well, we did, well no, we, we proved it. We went to see, everybody thought it was urban, but we went to the suburbs, and there he was. And and we put the pen in his in his bony fingers, and then we moved the hand across the page, and so it's actually signed "Steamboat Willie" by Walt Disney's bony fingers. All right, as you... time traveled, and this is the best we could do. Uh, Father, forgive us. We know not what we have said on the previous part of this program. If you're listening to it in its entirety, because. We weren't supposed to record today. We were going to record tomorrow, but five billion things happened in the wrestling business this week, and so we are trying to get a jump on all the new news and all the the headlines by doing this. Pretend then will this will be dropped into your program, the drive through. So it'll be it'll be dropped through later on, and and we're very confused about where our time of frame of reference is on the day and date. Well, what a lot of people are confused about, Jim, we've heard from a lot of the listeners, a lot of feedback already. Does the news that we're about to talk about mean that the raw reviews will stop on the show at the end of 2024? <sighs> Is Jim ready to accept, to adopt, to go with the flow, to check out Netflix? To tolerate, to use reluctantly how the hell do you use the netflix what what kind of what kind of things do i have to get my own tower do i have to get any kind of antenna what equipment do i need to purchase to use the netflix you have at least a couple in your office right now you could use it on your computer oh, you could God. use it on your phone you oh, could use God. it on your tv it's Wait, on I, every no, smart tv I, how in the world am i going to use Netflix on my landline. On your landline? My, you said my phone. Your cell phone. Smartphone. I, well, I don't have the smartphone. I have the flip phone. 
it it's got a screen on there, but it's just usually blue with a fucking day and date. If anyone else in the house happened to have a smartphone, perhaps a young woman who's with the times. Stacy's got the, the those type of things, but I tried to encourage her not to bring them out in my presence. Well, she could access Netflix on her phone while you watched it on your computer or your TV. Oh, it works on a TV. That's right. Well, and then now we're talking. So I guess at some point I may very well break down between now and 2025 and, and get the, get the Netflix guy to come out and hook me up for the Netflix. Well, it's not like that. It'll be on a smart TV. It'll be an app. Or if you had it. No, on I don't, I or... don't want, I don't want TVs or anything. I've already, the refrigerator talked to me the other day. God damn it. What did it say? It actually, it made a fart noise. That's a message that Stacy sent me from somewhere else in the house. I was in the kitchen, minding my own business, preparing my burger patties when suddenly the refrigerator went ding and then it went. <laughs> and then she went. <laughs> yeah, something. It was actually, it was wetter than that. Something like that. So I've already got the refrigerator talking to me. I don't want another appliance that's smarter than I am. Things just start going on and off by themselves around here these days. I thought you already had a smart TV in the house. Well, it, it's technically it is, but it doesn't. Well, now, son of a bitch. Even though I have the cable box hooked up to it, it is a smart TV. And when the oven is preheated, I get a graphic on the TV that tells me the oven's preheated. From that new smart oven that I fucking got. I didn't realize you, now I understand why you hate all the smart stuff. I didn't realize you guys are knee deep in it. Oh, no. Every single I'm, thing you've mentioned so far is a smart item. I'm knee deep in it. Stacy's head first in it. <laughs> all this new shit. <laughs> Mistake I made was making enough money to pay for this shit. Now, and I'm sure they're all conspiring against us at night. The refrigerator's telling the stove and telling the dishwasher, hey, just as soon as he walks by in the dark, fucking throw the goddamn little drawer in the bottom of the stove out. It, it, he'll trip and he'll fall headfirst into the dishwasher and you can scald him. See, you have to believe if all the concerns about AI are real, and how could they not be? If we get to the point where the computers decide to take over, they would all communicate with each other. Yes. They'd all be part of the same fraternity of human-destroying robots. Well, this is a real bleak episode so far. Yeah, and 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 there's a, the 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 new room that we got remodeled. You can't use the light switches in there. You got to speak to ECMO or whatever the guy's name is. Tell him turn ECMO? the fucking lights on. <laughs> Who's ECMO? Hey ECMO, turn the lights on. Or hey ECMO, uh, turn Alexa? the heat up. Whatever. I don't know. It's some guy's name. ECMO. I don't know. No, I guess not. Well. So I just, I just keep my head down when I go in there. I'm always, I, I put a robe on or I'm always dressed just in case the, the fucking light bulbs are taking pictures of me to send out in space to their master overlords. All right, what are we, we're talking about the Netflix. But back to Netflix, another way you can access it, a lot of people, including myself, my cable company has it now in the cable guide. I can go to a Netflix channel, sign into my account and just watch it through the cable box. Yeah. How do you sign into the account? I just turn my TV on. That's what that's what we used to. Just turn the goddamn TV on. Now you got to turn the TV on, make sure the cable box is on, hit the right input for the fucking TV so it doesn't take you out into the goddamn interwebs. It's a lot of where the things have to fucking load. It's a lot of work. When I was a kid, you just turned the goddamn TV on. Well, again, the question before we get to the story, if WWE's main show, at a minimum, just that, will be on Netflix, we'll see what happens when the Peacock deal is up with the premium live events and everything else, will you be willing to check out Netflix or... Yes, yes, I said earlier, some way or another, we'll figure out how to have the Netflix hooked up over here. Because I know you, you'll browbeat me until I do, so, but I'm not looking forward to it. Do they have on-screen fast-forward? Can I DVR this type of thing? These are questions. We can't, we can't just sit there live for three hours. You can 
fast forward, you could pause, you could do all these things, but also there's an archive there. So you don't have to DVR it. Everything's just there. And it picks up wherever you left off. Unless you don't want that, you can go back to the beginning. Hmm. Well, all right. All right. Imagine a virtual DVD. I guess that'd be the best way to put it to you. You put the DVD in, you have the menu option. You can press play, you can pause, you can fast forward. It's just like that. But See, I don't still yet trust DVDs. I think it's it's an emerging technology. I don't think it's going to stand up the test of time like VHS did. But nevertheless, the point is, I think it's awfully rude of the WWE, since we've started saying nice things about them lately, to go and do this and go to the to the streaming television and piss me off just for only $5 billion. Certainly, they could have taken a little bit lower offer from somebody else knowing that, well, Cornette's not going to be happy about this. But there, there's the thanks you get. Let's go to the headline here. I have an article from Variety, January 23rd, 2024, by Joe Otterson. Netflix WWE strike deal to move Monday Night Raw to streamer beginning in 2025 for $500 million per year. <laughs> Let's stop right there. <laughs> a wrestling company is going to be paid $500 million a year for one of their shows to air somewhere. That's incredible. One. One of them. And for 10 years, and some wise ass on Twitter said, well, but they say there's a clause they can get out after five years, so it's not really a five billion. Okay, two and a half billion dollars. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's, yeah. now the, the, the question, I guess the thing is, that they figure, first of all, because we talked about, well, they they years ago, and Vince's big thing was we we want to be back on network TV, and they got Fox. Now they've lost Fox. But at the same time, we said, well, would they want to be on streaming? Because, you know, they're still not going to be as visible, maybe, as they've been on some type of regular television. But for $500 million a year for one of the shows, that's not even all of their rights fees. They could run Mighty Mouse cartoons and goddamn wouldn't have to lift another finger, wouldn't they? Well, the other thing you got to remember, and I could see what I could find out about the actual numbers, but I believe the amount of homes right now subscribed to cable in the United States is somewhat close to, if not equal to, the amount of U.S. homes subscribed to Netflix. Oh, well, and actually, that's a, a point I was going to make before I got sidetracked with the, you know, the, they're switching their whole model, is that over 10 years and getting paid all that money anyway, by the time it's 11 years from now, I guess they're figuring everybody's going to be streaming this shit. So we'll, we'll be on equal footing with almost anybody else, network television or whatever. They're thinking ahead. Maybe... By then, hopefully, I'm just quietly reading a book in a chair rather than having to stream every goddamn thing. But that's, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's an unheard of amount of money that they're going to be taking in just to produce television that is watched by still, even though they're doing very well, what a fifth of the amount of people it was watching it 25 years ago when... They weren't even in the same stratosphere. This is just insane. And once again, Tony Khan, whack. They're like, fuck you. You spent your father's hundred million over the last five years. We're gonna make two and a half billion from for one show in that same amount of time coming up. And let's remind everyone, it has it here in this article. The rights to SmackDown were sold to NBC Universal and USA Network in a five-year $1.4 billion deal. NXT to the CW, apparently between 25 or between 20 and 25 million a year for five years. So that's 125 with the 1.4 and the 1.6. It's almost closing in on $7 billion. Plus merch. Plus merch, yeah. <laughs> and trans. Trans is, is extra. So, I mean, that, uh, you know, again, um, 
it's a ridiculous amount of money. And, you know, who could, I, I guess Vince saw this, but Vince has seen a lot of things and they didn't come to fruition, but he can, he can say he saw this one. But again, it's a sign also that the new ownership, they've got everybody in place and bringing people back, which we'll talk about in a second. But they, they can go in and talk to these people and make these deals because they're so heavy now with UFC and WWE and the whole TKO thing and Nick Khan, the Hollywood agents and the Ari Emanuels and these fucking Wheeler dealers. This is Hollywood now. And the amount of money is, is ludicrous. But the one thing you read in that story quoted it as Monday Night Raw, but the actual original release telling us what was going on, didn't it just say WWE Raw? Because Raw. a few people picked up yeah. that they didn't say specifically Monday night. It could be, it could be any old night. It would and make sense, would I would think, to keep football. it on. I mean, if it's Netflix and they have no, there's no programming issues. You're not bumping into anything else. It's a streaming platform. I would keep them on Mondays, wouldn't you? Well, how would that work in terms of they're, they're going to air it live like they have been? Right? Right. Would I, I guess assume. would I guess less commercials? See, I've never watched the Netflix. I don't know what they do about that type of thing. But the Netflix has introduced commercials, but in some of their programs, I mean something like this where they're paying all this money, I'm sure there'll be something, but it won't be the level of USA Network, I wouldn't think. Well, but also you said it it's it's right there. It's archived. You can go back to it and you can start in the middle or whatever. So the way that they've now USA Network or whatever network, any of the WWE programs, whether it's SmackDown on Fox, Raw on USA, or whatever it's going to go into, blah, 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 they air the program live on that particular network. And then they put selected YouTube clips up. But those networks on demand services if they have them are behind and otherwise in other words you can't go to fox on demand the next day and watch that smackdown you got to wait a week or two and depends on the system i don't know if that's universal everywhere i think well i think show. it may be because the, the here's the question i'm about to ask you because this was a concern even you know back in the day if you can watch it anytime, if it's going to be rerun multiple times, for example, that takes the urgency away from seeing it live, or if you can see it immediately on demand, it takes the urgency away from seeing it live. They can't do anything about people's personal DVRs, just like they couldn't do anything about VCRs. But with the Netflix service, is there going to be, if they can, if you can watch it anytime after it happens, then is there going to be the urgency to watch that live and the attention paid to the numbers of, of its first airing when anybody can just hop in and start from then on out? I think that's the one. Am I asking this the right way? I think it's a great question. I personally believe that it's very similar to TV in this way. Live is live. No matter what's archived or what you DVR or what's available, everything's available everywhere right away. But something live is still a thing that if you have an excited fan base, if it's programming that's rewarding to the fan base, if you have a lot of good things going on. I like the way you worded that, by the way. If it's programming that's rewarding to the fan base. If it's good and people have a reason to keep coming back and they want to keep seeing what's going to happen next, live, I think even if everything's instantly available, live is still the thing. Twitter you know, anything that happens on Twitter, everything's live. So, like, even that small percentage of the audience, no one's going to be like, I'm going to wait until after I get a chance to watch this. Right away, <laughs> as soon as something happens that's out there, you want to see it before you read about it. Well, you may be right. We'll see what happens. with. But do they care at that point? Does Netflix have ratings? I'm sure but the, there's all kinds of ways. The refrigerators are talking to the fucking stoves. I'm sure there's a way that they can measure exactly how many people are viewing a program. If they're paying that much money for it, they ought to be. But will there be emphasis on any ratings per se on Raw, Netflix, like there still will be on SmackDown on USA Network or whatever? 
It's funny too. Netflix is the one that was doing that Vince McMahon docu series, right? <laughs> I wonder if that got fucking uh, eighty six as part of the deal. It'll be interesting to see what happens there. This is a major move. You know, I thought the two most likely candidates were Amazon and Netflix, just because I think this is what's happening. These guys have money to throw around. The way cable was a disruptor for the NFL and all sports, actually, that's right now what streaming is. There's a reason they're spending all this money to try to get football. Apple's doing it. I never thought Apple would really be involved in this. But it's all about streaming for the future because the kids today, you know, from, from college down, they don't give a fuck about TV. They don't give a fuck about cable. They don't even know what broadcast is in a lot of cases. They have their phones. And mostly it's short form stuff on TikTok. And WWE has, I'm sure, a big social media plan with all this. But if you're going to watch something long form, your kids aren't saying, hey, can we get cable? They're saying, hey, can I have the password for Netflix? Can I have the password for Disney Plus? That kind of thing. It's all about streaming for the future. And I think that's why Netflix spent this amount of money. It's an incredible amount of money. Think about the premium they're getting above the previous. What is it, like a 30% raise above the previous? I think it's 33%. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's incredible. Well, and and how much is it to subscribe to Netflix? Are they going to have to get, is it $5? They need 100 million new subscribers a year? Or is this uh, just for the for the love of the game and the cachet of being able to throw around the WWE programming? I think Netflix needs original programming. They need live programming. They need things that people are going to watch. It's almost amazing in a lot of cases that these platforms are so late to the dance with wrestling. That was one of the few things cable got right in the early years. Wrestling fans are a big audience. Wrestling has a big audience. Well, I don't know if cable got it right in the early years or if they just figured it out because the fans were doing it on their own. When I was one of the, the tuned in with its smart fans as a teenager, that was the goddamn dream to be able to get cable because it, it wasn't in most people's areas. And as soon as, as as you were able to get it, if you were a wrestling fan, you got it for Georgia Championship Wrestling, for some of the other programs that may not have been on national cable, but when you got a cable system back in those days, you got, uh, you know, some stray out-of-town channels that would potentially have a different territory's wrestling. So wrestling was selling cable like it sold televisions in 1948. and. And, and now television has finally given wrestling all the love that it's been a love hate relationship wrestling loved TV because it needed it for the past 75 years and TV hated wrestling because most of the, most of the stations, most of the networks would begrudgingly put it on because people watched it, but it was only every once in a while you found one that really loved it. So now they're, they're loving the WWE, at least, long time over this whole thing. Jimmy asked about the price of Netflix. The standard subscription with ads is six ninety nine a month. Standard without ads is fifteen forty nine a month. Premium Ooh. is twenty two ninety nine. Unlimited ad free viewing, and you can use up to four different devices simultaneously. With the capability to download content onto six devices. What the f So you could use four at the who's same time, watch but download on the six. Who's going to watch four things at the exact same time? Well, maybe you want to walk from room to room and, you know, mingle, say hello to everyone. <laughs> yeah, that wouldn't take me long, but anyway. Um, it's coming out. Look, Netflix is on every TV all of a sudden. What, what the hell has happened? I mean, like, <laughs> be like Vince going into the studio. The cake is in the oven. Instantly, it all pops up to. Netflix. Well, the whole hee-haw gang of the WWE slash TKO was uh, rang the the bell at the New York Stock Exchange the the morning that this whole thing was announced. So we've gone from wrestling promoters leaving town under cover of darkness with the fucking house from the rec center in the trunk of their car to 
they're ringing the bell at the New York Stock Exchange over a $5 billion deal. Did you, because I saw the clips, I didn't see, because I'm not watching that early in the morning. I assume you are, the CNBC, so oh, you I keep saw. Yeah. track of all the financials. But who all was standing there? And and what happened to Vince's mustache? Let's talk about all of this. Well, they had a bunch of people standing there at the New York Stock Exchange, or I guess that's what it was, uh, that was where it was, uh, yeah. Yes. A bunch of people there, including Ari Emanuel, I believe, Nick Khan, Triple H, The Rock. Vince McMahon sans mustache. Mark now, Shapiro. still, his, his, his hair was still blacker than a banker's heart, but, but no mustache. He looks insane no matter what he's doing right now. He just looks completely fucking whacked out. And some <laughs> woman is probably with him like, yeah, you look good. He looks like a fucking train wreck. Like, <laughs> looks like he's been painted up there. Like, all of a sudden, he gets pushed out there. His hair is jet black. He Everyone looks, else looks he, normal around him. He just stands he, out. He looks like the Seinfeld episode where, <laughs> where George had the guy fucking taken out of the picture accidentally, and then he had him painted <laughs> back in. He's painted into every fucking scene anywhere. Well, they rang the bell, and if there was ever a day to do it, this was the day, the day they announced the Netflix deal, and the day they announced that Dwayne The Rock Johnson, we may have to pay him money <laughs> for saying that, Dwayne Johnson is now on the WWE Board of Directors. He's been given the rights outright to the name The Rock. He's got that Vince McMahon deal when Vince McMahon uh, sold the company. He got full control of everything that he's ever done ever. And did you, did you hear about the, uh, I don't know if you call it a salary or the, the payoff? $30 million. $30 million just for The Rock. $30 million and the ownership of the name The Rock. And and please, Rock, come be on our board of directors. Oh, of course I thank you very much. And boom, and done like that, just bandying $30 million around. But now they've not only got <laughs> they've not only got billions of dollars in guaranteed money over the next decade, but they've got a, I said it was Hollywood earlier. They've got not only the biggest stars in the wrestling business. But one of the biggest stars in Hollywood is one of the biggest stars in the history of the wrestling business and is now on the board of directors. And The Rock has done, amazingly enough, what Cody knew and Cody wanted to do it. And a few other people have tried to do it. But in the modern era, one of the boys can't buy into or own part of the office anymore. That's what got it. That's what every wrestler from. Days gone by aspired to. I got points in the office. I own a piece of the office. That's where the money could be made. And in the modern era, it has this is the closest thing to having that happen. And Cody being an EVP, the other ones it had no fucking clue of even what business they were in and just wanted important titles and to be able to tell people what to do, but Cody being the son of Dusty knew because that was Dusty's thought process. And so now one of the boys has technically been able to make it as close to ownership of a big promotion as you can these days. Well, Triple H was there. Let's not forget that. Well, but you know what? Even he, uh, he had to marry into the family that already owned the company, this is like one of the boys just being a big enough star that Eddie Graham said, said to fucking Paul Jones, cut him in for 5% of Atlanta and he'll come and draw you some money or whatever, the, the old-fashioned way. Yeah, and this is also, a, you know, this is also something that helps him. He hasn't had a good couple of years. You know, you have to wonder, would he be here, Dwayne Johnson, right now? Would this all be happening if he hadn't just, you know, completely bombed in his attempt to take over the DC film universe? with Black Adam, which was a an epic disaster for the studio. You hate The Rock. No, it's a fact. You are, it's you true. are a, an anti-Rockite. I mean, look, I definitely think he's completely full of shit to the core as a human being. But this has nothing to do with that. This is me discussing the facts that have happened that have been reported in newspapers. Hey, he's had a hell of a couple. Of, he just got a check for $30 million to be exactly. on a board of directors. That's, that's a horrible fucking couple of years. He doesn't I need you defending him. 
I'm just saying I would consider my last couple of years, if I had just got out of goddamn solitary confinement where every day from noon to midnight I had to stand on my head in a fucking two-foot pile of shit and then got $30 million at the end of it, well, the past couple of years hadn't been all bad. I agree. It's the Young Bucks argument. Who gives a fuck? We got all the money. I completely <laughs> understand. <laughs> but... He can't deny the fact the XFL's been a fucking disaster. Black Adam was a fucking disaster. Well, now, wait a minute. Young the Rock XFL... is one of the worst television shows in the history of television. I went, now, there there was My Mother the Car, but I didn't the XFL just merge with something? Yeah, with like two other leagues that make no money and are going nowhere. Well, now, see, now they're, they're three times yeah. as, as big and important as they all used to be because they merged together. They can call their Super Bowl Super Clash. I'm sure it'll do great. Well, there, as long as as long as Vern and Greg aren't running it, then nobody will get paid. But you brought up something interesting before, and let's talk about The Rock's involvement here. Because The Rock is a big star, and The Rock has shown in limited times coming back, used, I would say correctly in a sense, his material's terrible. It's lame. And if he does it too much, he's going to get booed. But to have him come back the way they've used him has been fairly smart. Do you see this as a way to now you know, he's directly involved. Not that he wasn't already with his fucking confidant, literally confidant, Nick Khan there. Now you can get him to come back anytime you need him. You know, now the question's about whether they're going to do Roman versus Rock. There are no more questions. They're going to do Roman versus Rock. Yeah. He's there. It may not be right away or it could be right away, but it's going to happen now. Also, we're going to get Nia Jax all over Raw and Rock's daughter all over NXT. It's just going to happen. That's the way it works. Well, but the question was, you asked, uh, with Roman and uh, with Roman and Reigns. What a match Roman that'll be. <laughs> oh, my God, the holograms. <laughs> with Roman and Rock, I think it's going to be this year at WrestleMania because the Rock is, is, he knows he doesn't need to wait too much longer just because of his age and, you know, fucking uh, real life. I mean, you know, he, he wants to, you can't say he ever goes out and, and doesn't physically want to be what he, the people perceive him to be. So I think he's, it's, that's probably going to be sooner than later. I would imagine at WrestleMania in Philadelphia, WrestleMania 40, whatever the case. As far as, well, now he's there whenever you want him. They can't want him too much, though, because this, it would cease to be special. When you have literally a goose that can lay a golden egg, don't goddamn stand over the fucking goose with a stick going, come on, goddamn it, give me another one, give me another No, it needs to be special. It needs to be an appearance just to speak to everybody for a surprise in a major arena every once in a while that's also televised. Uh, it needs to be after the WrestleMania match, I would imagine that maybe that's the last match or maybe there's one in a, a couple of years. Maybe he's a referee at some point for WrestleMania. I mean, because that doesn't take anybody's spot away and still adds The Rock's name to a card. And people would have flashbacks of the Attitude Era when they did those type of things. What if The Rock doesn't want to do what the head of creative wants? Well, then The Rock ain't going to do it. Because that creates a really bad dynamic right there. But the thing is that they're also not going to go to him and say, well, God damn it, we really, they're going to say, oh, you don't like, well, you know, we, we thought we might run it by you. It's going to be that kind of thing. He's on the board of directors. He's a, a huge movie star and he doesn't have to do anything. So they're not going to fucking argue with him. Unless it, if it was Triple H who believed in it and who could take him in a closed room he'd be the one if anybody to make the big pitch or the try to twist the arm but otherwise they'll work around whatever fucking hesitation there is you brought up roman versus the rock potentially at wrestlemania with this deal with the rocks direct involvement now and everything going forward does that change what you think the finish should be And now because taking the business aspect and real life out of it, it's a downer if The Rock comes back at this point and gets beat by Roman Reigns. That would be the... Because then, that's almost like Andre versus The Sheik in Toronto. Because the people, they, they've they kept the streak of Roman Reigns and the undefeated nature. They've kept that going well. 
But sooner or later, there has to be the fucking, you know, the ultimate fucking comeuppance for the heel. And if they don't get that, then they get pissed off Andre and Sheik. And the, after Sheik's seven-year win streak and fucked every baby face in the business, Andre the Giant, 1974, the people, oh my God, he nobody can beat Andre. And four minutes later, Sheik throws the fireball and Andre rolls out and is counted out with a burned face. And that was the beginning of the downhill slide. It, 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 you can't go too far. Who else? would they buy and believe was going to beat Roman Reigns if The Rock shows up and doesn't do it. It would take the wind out of people's sails that night. And then even if, okay, then say Cody was going to fucking beat Roman at the next big pay-per-view or whenever, the people might say, fuck it, I don't believe it. He beat The Rock and it it hurts business because they won't buy it or watch it. That's what I'm saying. Let me look at it the other way. I don't think that The Rock should be the one to end things for Roman because no one's getting over, no one's getting elevated, no one's getting a chance to prove themselves in a spot. It's just returning to The Rock physically, age-wise, how busy he is. That, that's a that's a I, thing I agree. To do. I agree with you. That agree? Too. I I agree. <laughs> I agree with. Uh, did I say agree? You said agree. I, I agree with that. <laughs> I agree with that. I agree with that. Exa That's why sometimes trying to figure these finishes, you're in the corner, damned if you do and damned if you don't. You got a match that can draw, but what do you fucking do with it? And if there was a way that somehow someone else could be the one to defeat Roman for a championship while The Rock and, and Roman could live in its own universe and just ma mano a mano, uh, they could have that, not for the title. Is there, and, and is there a way, see, we don't, we, we're not mind reading the creative. Is there a way that they believe that if they do something in such a, a manner, they can turn Roman babyface out of something and have him run against Haman and someone then that could play into it also. There could be a double whammy. One thing could be one night, one thing could be the next night. You don't know what they're thinking. But it is a problem. You don't want to beat the fucking rock and take the wind out of everybody's sails, but at the same time, you do want someone going for You want Cody to finish the story. Or you want whoever you want, a, a full-time, younger, main roster regular to get that rub and advance from there although the idea of the rock losing if he is going to be around gives you the chance to do something really different with him in terms of week-to-week -week booking of some kind of storytelling the rock didn't win what does that mean what is he going to do the other option i hadn't even thought about until while you were talking about it you know, we're thinking the match has to happen. What if it's Cody versus Roman with The Rock as the referee? And you're just setting up the bigger match at a later date. Doesn't have to be WrestleMania. They do stadium shows all the time now. Well, then you would probably be able to let Cody finish his story and at the same time set up Rock and Roman. Cody gets to get his hand raised by The Rock. Well, there, he, he might yank it out of the socket. Well, but he, but and now he some is quite people, large yeah well and and now people are reporting on the interwebs from what i saw this morning that uh it's going to be roman and rock and it's going to be punk and cody as the co-main event and there's also the rumor and when we talk about raw or if we have talked about it already in this fucking show where we're all over the page rumors now and i was going to say this anyway and I'll go on record as saying this now before if this is what happens, any any more of it might leak out where I don't look like I just came up with this idea on my own, but it struck me when watching Raw, if Gunther, if Seth Rollins can't be healed fully by WrestleMania and do what he normally does, which is very iffy, 
But if Gunther won the Rumble and picked Seth Rollins, then Gunther could go in there and target that leg, and as good as both of them are, you could have a 10-minute match with a, with a bad fucking knee that the heel is working on, and Seth would have an out to lose the title to Gunther, who would then be elevated even further because now he's a world champion. And he would have to vacate the Intercontinental title without losing, just like the Ultimate Warrior did when he beat Hulk Hogan. Boom goes the dynamite, and then the reason for Punk and Cody would be that they were number... Well, they were the next to last and the third to last to be eliminated before Gunther, and they probably caused it themselves to each other, and therefore... Punk blocked Cody from telling his story, but Cody blocked Punk from fucking achieving his dream. And there you well, we got to have this out. Well, we will talk about Cody and Punk uh, in a little bit. I will say Gunther, no disrespect to Samoa Joe, but Gunther could be the best bully world champion heel in a long time. Well, watching, yeah, and watching that promo, just watch even when he's kind of being nice to people, there's a bullying because <laughs> of his size and his look and the way he delivers his lines. And then you see him wrestle. He's an in-ring bully. He's great. And and he and Joe, uh, different body types, different work styles, different everything. But, and, but at the same time, they do have that similarity. I agree with you. But Gunther, I think, even is a, a better bully because he not only looks like, you know, a foreign, you know, German menace, but he looks like a narc. And, and he just has that fucking look to him like, you fucking prick. So I think he's the, if he was 17 years old, he, you know, you can see him in a sweater stuffing somebody in a locker and giving him a wedgie. Well, that's right, but maybe not The Rock, and that's the story of The Rock now on the board of directors. Jim, I mentioned Punk and Cody. We'll talk about them in a minute. More news broke this past week. It has been reported that Kevin Patrick has been <laughs> removed from the SmackDown broadcast team. And sent immediately to a uh, an oxygen tent because he oh. was hyperventilating when he was <gasps> told the news. I got a pink slip. <sighs> he's back. pink. I'll smack down with Butch. Oh, he's peaked down again. <sighs> Seriously, whoever decided to put him on commentary did not do him any favors. That was clearly not the role for him. It was ridiculous. And then you put him next to someone like Corey Graves or... A Wade Barrett, everyone else has a strong yeah. voice, and he's panting. Oh, he's panting. Oh, oh, look at Escobar. Oh, he's going to stop. Oh. So I don't know uh, how much more of a future as a commentator he has at wrestling, but maybe. But no, uh, the, the thing is, Tony Khan's going to pig him up. He's going to hire him immediately because he's going to start calling when, when Kenny gets back from his problem with his guts being malfunctioning then Kevin Patrick is going to be Kenny's announcer, and that way we, we can have the talent and the announcer both doing the phone sex voice. The Breathless Bunch. The Breathless Bunch. Hey, think about that. When has somebody had their own announcer? And now, I'd like to introduce <sighs> my announcer who will announce me. Let me introduce you, Kenny. <sighs> Omega. <sighs> Seriously, how, well, it, how bad was how bad was he, and how bad of a fit was he? It it well, it, I don't know what his. I've never met the young man personally, so maybe he was trying to show how, you know, exasperated you can get at all of this craziness going on here, and put the action over whatever. But it just it just it didn't seem, and he was so up there like that. It. it I understand that he started out as an interviewer, right? And then they just, for some reason, they're always looking for young, supposedly good-looking. I guess that's in the eyes of the beholder. Panting. Um, say again? Panting. Panting. No, was, oh. the panting has oh. not been a requirement up until now. They're, they want young, supposedly good-looking, camera-friendly people to be the announcers rather than the people who announce like announcers, which is, was the battle that Jim Ross fought for years, and, you know, the battle that Kevin Kelly fought, uh, you know, on a losing streak most of the time because Kevin Dunn liked Michael Cole. Michael Cole's a night I've never yelled at or been mad at Michael Cole, but he didn't know a wristlock from a wristwatch his first, 
I did his first show. Remember, goddamn, goddamn. Um, not only did I work out with him, so to speak, as an announcer, but it was him and I that did the first SmackDown in April 1999. And go back, Michael has improved. If you don't like him now, you wouldn't have liked him then because he didn't know anything about wrestling, but he had the real television background. That's what Kevin Dunn pushed. So there, there you go. Kevin Dunn is gone. See you later, Kevin Patrick. Um. <gasps> Bucky Beaver. <sighs> a lot of things are changing. There, there a lot of, you know, the Vince's old rules. And we talked about, you know, they're going to do some changes in production in terms of the flavor of how it's presented. But, boy, there's nothing stopping them now from going. But they also just look at the, your other program under your umbrella, the UFC. They have announcers that interview people and hold a microphone for them. And they presented in more of a credible way than having the fighters just wander out to the octagon and do soliloquies with each other. So maybe we can look forward to some of these tweaks and changes being implemented. But, uh, you know, I've, I've, maybe Kevin's still going to be working there. Patrick, I'm talking about. Huh, huh. I mean, maybe he's going to be blowing up the balloons for the office parties. I don't know, but... <gasps> We don't want the young man to be unemployed. We just want him to get goddamn treatment for that COPD. Too bad there aren't 976 numbers anymore. He'd be good at that. Wait a minute. I've still got... I can give it to you off the air. It works. It's the same girl all the time, but it works. All right. Well, that's uh, Kevin Patrick. She sounds a little old. I think it's because her dentures don't fit properly. One of the more ridiculous clips we've ever put on YouTube. Here's the uh, Kevin Patrick clip, but Jim... Moving on from there. Yes. We're not going to talk about all of Raw right now, but here in this time travel session, let's talk about something you and I talked about off air. You had not seen it. I had. I told you my thoughts without spoiling too much. Everyone's talking about it. Over a million people so far on YouTube talking about it. CM Punk and Cody Rhodes on Monday Night Raw. Well, yes, and, and we had talked Tuesday morning because that's when we... Uh, gathered together on the phone to discuss all of the breaking news. And I said, I'm going to watch it, but I haven't yet. And you said, well, you won't commit yourself, but holy shit, this was at a completely different level and tone. And as, as we said, a new day with new people in charge and new, or maybe old things being allowed now that were verboten before. But this felt like a fucking wrestling show for the time they were talking to each other. It well, you could you could close your eyes and you could envision this happening in Mid South Wrestling or this happening on in Crockett Promotions or in the far distant past good old days of WCW before Turner Broadcasting dismantled it. Big names talking to each other in the middle of the ring. They didn't go this long back in those days. But it was serious. It was, it was adult. It was. It had both guys sounded like they meant what they said, and they told. And this is Jerry Jarrett's old maxim. They told enough of the truth that people knew to be the truth, so that when they started working, it wasn't an abrupt change it was a natural progression and you couldn't tell where one left off and the other began it was uh, it, there was uh, you we know that cody is a huge baby face and punk is popular and controversial he hasn't established he's going to be a baby face in the ring he hasn't said anything or give, given any of the you know, normal activity of a heel. He's not coming out being an asshole verbally. He's not knocking people. He's not lying. He's talking to people and telling the truth and being a normal human being. But he said that he didn't come there to make friends. He came to make money. And so even though you've got nominally two baby faces, there's still, it's great that there is the wonder of what's going to happen and who's going to do what. And whether or not 
you know, if one of them or the other wins the Royal Rumble, that they will still remain friends, wink, wink. You know, something might happen. But this was just, it was big time. And it was too, and the people were not only popping and chanting for both guys, but they were listening to what they were saying to the point that the fucking zingers didn't get cheers or boos. They got ooze like at a goddamn studio audience rather than an arena with 15,000 people in it. They were hanging on the words. They were listening to what they were saying. And I, coming out of this, you not only want to know what's going to happen between these two in the Royal Rumble, you want to see them wrestle in some fashion. You want to know the next thing that's going to happen or take place or whether you've guessed it right or not. This was fucking brilliant. Talk for me for a second. Well, I thought the zingers, if we're going to call them that, were creative. It was creatively done. The way they hit each other, you're waiting for it. And when Punk hit him first, like you said, the crowd, ooh. And then Cody hit him back perfectly. And, you know, I hate to, I mean, I want you to talk more about what you think about the segment, but let's bring it up here. I hate to always have to go back to this, but enough people are talking about it. <laughs> you look at the dichotomy now between AEW and WWE. What you just saw on Raw should have been the biggest moment in Dynamite history. It should have been something leading to the biggest event or moment in AEW history. It's something that should have been on a path of growing viewership or interest. I believe the Raw ratings, this segment peaked at 1.9 million viewers live. Good Lord. It jumped. It, was, it like jumped like 300,000 viewers. And then you see like the Young Bucks come back and no one cares. It's crazy not to look at Cody and Punk here in this situation and realize this could have been somewhere else. And now look at where we are today. Well, yeah, it, it's Tony's most high-profile alumni that used to work there, and Cody was not, not popular with that audience because he was the anomaly amongst the original group that they brought there that wasn't the trampoline play playground parkour expert that was the business mind that wanted to be Dusty Rhodes' son, that wanted to take interest in the production and the creative and the promoting and be an executive, and the other ones wanted to jack around with the, you know, Tony's fucking pocketbook. And so... Off he goes, and he becomes the hottest baby face in the biggest company in the world. And then Punk, who goes in there to AEW with the attitude of, I want to prove that I can make a difference, and I'm going to draw him some money, and we're going to take this thing somewhere. And he did, but they didn't. And especially the, the buckaroos were so insistent on keeping that campaign up to fucking drive him nuts and run him off that finally, all right, fuck it. And he immediately goes to the fucking same company and becomes the biggest fucking attraction they've got. Because which he, one are you talking about? Which one of these two punk, guys are you talking about? Okay. Punk. And, and now if, every time he, he came out and broke social media, his quarter, his first quarter on television jumped 400,000 fucking viewer jumped not did like he was doing on Saturday night for the other guys but jumped 400,000 so Tony had all the ingredients for the cure for cancer and he fucking threw them out because he had a couple of fucking stale expired NyQuil pills and now they're doing all the numbers that you know, that we've talked about, but it's part of this five. He should be five bill fill, by the way, instead of one bill fill. But we're talking about these guys doing this number, these numbers over here. And meanwhile, Tony is left with a hospital ward full of top talent and a hangdog look on his face. Like, what the fuck? I booked a tournament. Well, we'll get back to your thoughts about this promo. Let me just bring this up just to compare in terms of decision making and how hot things are and how cold things are, CM Punk and Cody Rhodes' War of Words, the full segment, not to count any clip segments they've already put up, 
in one day on WWE's YouTube has done 1.3 million views. And that would probably be an addition to the people, almost 2 million that saw it live. Why would they go back and watch it? Maybe some of them watched it again, but there, there's unique viewers, as they say. Six days ago, AEW put up the video for the Young Bucks interview with Renee on Dynamite. Oh, their big return where they were going to explain themselves and what was going on. Spy versus spy. That went up six days ago. It's done 100,000 views. <laughs> for the record, the Jim Cornette review of that segment went up three days ago, and that has 91,000 views. Ah. So we're going to pass that. So we got three days to catch up. More people listen to us talk about what they said than listen to them say it. The fuck? And that's the road AEW went down. And again, they didn't just run off Punk. Punk's not the only one we're talking about here. Cody Rhodes. A lot more diplomatic than CM Punk, but he's in WWE for a lot of reasons. And again, they never mention AEW. Not that they would have. But in AEW, if this had happened, it would have been all about WWE. Well, all about yeah. something you did somewhere else. All about alluding to things from someplace else. They didn't do that here, and they could have. That would have been the because, lazy way well, out. Because they reveal themselves in in every promotional war, the outlaws, the opposition would talk about the number one company. The number one company wouldn't talk about the outlaws. But now, back then, the outlaws, they were bitter, and they were mad at these people, the promoters and the bookers and the top stars individually, and they wanted to talk bad about them on television to vent their spleen and get it out of their system. Well, now it's not that they're mad. They're marks. And when when Tony and any of his guys talk about on their television, well, when you main evented WrestleMania or when you did this or that or the other thing in the WWE, it's because to them that's a bigger deal than where they are now. They're revealing that they subconsciously, because they're marks and they're fans, and the worst kind of fans, marks, that puts them over to everybody as a bigger deal if they've been to the WWE. Or if they can talk about when they were together in the WWE. We used to be so, friends. Why aren't we friends? I want to be friends. We were all friends in the WWE. Well, you know, the first, ooh, you brought up before the reactions of the crowd. I think the first one may have been when Punk said, I want to talk about your dad. Yeah. That got the first reaction. Well, well, hold it. We've run off and left some of the people who didn't go to YouTube or see it. Um, this was the, it was the 10 o'clock hour on raw, but they started at, at nine 53 Eastern seven minutes till Cody did his entrance first and people sing his shit and whoa, and he got the big pops. And when he got in the ring before he could speak and really say anything, suddenly the music transitioned and it was like Mussolini. Ugh. In New Orleans. That works. See, there you go. Keep going. Baked oysters, if you please. <laughs> now it's but lazy. Anyway, now, now you're lazy. They got another big pop. And there was more big reactions. And Punk got in and they, Punk and Cody shook hands. And when they brought the music down, Punk got chance. But then some people were like, well, and they started chanting for Cody. And their whole interview, they started, they even had the proper expressions on their faces and the proper tension in their body language where they started out casually speaking with a little, a little edge to it, but as friends and nicely and, and it escalated like it would if they were really doing it. And you know, uh, but the story of it was basically Punk saying, hey, we're friends, and on Sunday morning, I hope that we're still going to be friends. And Punk wanted to talk about your dad, and ooh. And Punk said that Dusty called him in 2007 when Cody went to Ohio Valley Wrestling. So I'm sending my son to OVW, keep an eye on him. And it, Punk told Cody how proud he was of him because he didn't fall into the the traps and vices of many of our contemporaries, and he didn't have to keep an eye on Cody. But on Saturday, it feels like I'm breaking my promise because I won't be looking out for you. I'm going to do what I got to do. And then Cody 
I said, hey, ev everybody sees Dusty when they they see me, but I've done everything to be my own man. And when I showed up to OVW, by the way, OVW did not get this much goddamn conversation and attention on national TV when we were actually working with them. And now that now that it was the best years of everybody's life. But it, it, Cody admitted he showed up to OVW, a nepotism hire, and Punk had been in the business in the Indies for 10 years. But we got to be friends. And Saturday's bittersweet because there are no friends. But Punk said, well, what about Sunday? I can separate business from personal. Because the business to you is personal. You grew up in it. Now, so how are you going to separate this? And Punk uncorked a fucking brief little promo on how he saw Cody, not Dusty, the first time he met Cody because he didn't have that background. But two different paths have one similar goal. I mean, this was great shit. And then finally, Punk said, my father was an electrician. He was blue collar. I'm more the American dream than you are. Boom. That Ooh. was. Oh, what a line. And then Cody stiffened up a bit well let's talk about the pipe bomb and so punk tosses the mic flag off the microphone and cody told punk well you inspired people with that to, to, to get them to, to make changes and then you left and you didn't do any of that shit but i walked the walk where you didn't so that makes me more cm punk than you Ooh, oh, another, another one. What a line. Oh. Yes. And it, I, it, 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 this is also, I don't, I wasn't in the room, but I would be flabbergasted if the writers had more than the first draft and a vague outline on this. This is all punk and all Cody. And so punk sold that. He took his jacket off and got up in Cody's face and it was the fucking the Rock and Hogan, or Hogan and Andre, or whatever comparison you want. And Punk uncorked it. I can't even begin to describe it again. He was on a roll. And then Cody responds. And I'm like, this is great. And then Cody quoted Dusty, quoting John Wayne, and then vowed to go through Punk and the Rumble and started to walk past him. And Punk grabbed Cody's arm and jerked him around and they went nose to nose again and forehead to forehead. And the crowd was hot and they had dueling chants going. And then each guy kept their eyes on each other and they stepped out on opposite sides of the ring. 17 minutes of gold, Jerry Gold. That, uh, I mean, punks have been involved in several of them, but that was one of the better promo segments of, of modern fucking wrestling since we've been doing this, isn't it? Punk's been a part of several segments in AEW and WWE that we've said is the modern equivalent of Mid-South Wrestling. It's not exactly the same, but things would be different on TV now than it was in 1984 or 85, but the modern equivalent of what that would be, that feeling you would get watching it. The tone, the intensity, the inflection, the, That's right. the, the, the seriousness of the thing as serious as far as the guys involved are taking it seriously. Now, do you think they should have, before I say my next comment, I'll ask you the question. Do you think they should have had anyone out there to break them up? Should it have been something where they walk off on their own or should it have been something where if they're going to go face to face. They should be pulled away. You know, it, no, they didn't need. And, and because then, then we go into the, the lack of logic when there's going to be a fucking sledgehammer attack in the next segment, nobody comes out. If these two guys are fucking talking mean to each other and about to fight, shit, we better get out there. That's where they need an announcer and or an authority figure of the promotion, not the general man. Nick Aldis doesn't have to be out there, Adam Pierce for every goddamn deal, but someone that's official, that's a neutral party, and that's usually the announcer role in wrestling that would be there to step and say now gentlemen or just to react even facially not to butt in but to 
I mean, even you know, even the greatest band in the world needs a tambourine player. There's, you know, a little more cowbell, man. It adds something, some visual semblance of realism, and not only on the the presentation of the program, but when there was the Jim Ross or the Lance Russell or the Gordon Soley or the insert your favorite wrestling announcer standing there, it, there was just some visual representation that this guy is trying to explain to you no you can't fight no gentlemen gentlemen it didn't have to be a big pull apart but that's what wrestling is missing is and not only the announcer to do the the fills like the backup guitar player might in the middle like well i can't believe you said that and the other guy transitioned to and or just react or reiterate or sometimes clarify in a, a few words or one sentence and give it back to the guy when he's flummoxed. Like, you know, I think about the Lawler, uh, Jimmy Valiant confrontation on Memphis TV and how, as this is happening, as Jimmy Valiant's quickly going from being someone they tolerated to being an enemy of Lawler, there's people all around. Lance Russell's there. Dave, I think maybe still sitting down, <laughs> but Lance Russell's standing there. Wayne Ferris is out there. Various guys are out there. Right. I think Eddie Marlin may have been out there. This interaction's happening. It's not supposed to happen. It feels like something could happen, so we're all out here. Again, I'm not saying this needed that, but... Well, I, I see what you're saying, but see, again, then, that that was a different kind of thing because, number one, in the studio, as they started arguing, friends of theirs, who were friends of each person because they were both baby faces, Bill Dundee and Wayne Ferris was, was Lawler's cousin, but was teaming with Jimmy Valiant. They started wandering out because mutual friends of theirs were in an argument and it was, it was getting more hostile. And also they only had to walk 50 feet. <laughs> the, in this giant NBA arena, the WWE's also fucking established that everybody gets music if they're going to come out. This was too long and too involved and other people would have stepped on it because you would have had to have brought to have mutual friends of theirs come out. You'd had to brought some pretty big stars out. It would have been a distraction. I see where you're going with it. And it, and that did look more realistic in Memphis than this. But here's another thing. It seems like they ought to be able to do something like that further down this road. Because they got in starting out as friends, even though it got out of hand, the Memphis angle ended up in a fight. This didn't get physical, but who's to say that at some point after the Royal Rumble, that when they decide whether they're friends on Sunday morning, that maybe they would get more heated in a face-to-face -face argument and people would might start trickling out, agents, people in suits. Come on, guys, whatever the fuck, because... These guys are so real at it, they do need the background to create the atmosphere. But I almost think this one was better that nobody got in the fucking way. But I still would love to see a good, experienced announcer that can verbally referee and do the fills just to make it look good without taking over the fucking yeah. program. Without sticking their face in like Aubrey Edwards in that famous clip and yes, between the two yes. people facing off. You know, it builds upon several weeks of great segments that were talking segments on Raw. Drew McIntyre and Cody, Drew McIntyre and Punk. A lot of them centered around Drew McIntyre. But a lot of what SmackDown had, it feels like Raw's now getting in terms of these great segments with personality. You don't even mind that there isn't a match. It's supposed to be matches or women's tag matches anyway, <laughs> seems like. But this was an incredible segment and it leaves you intrigued what's going to happen next. This may be the most intrigued I am for a Royal Rumble in a very long time. Well, and I think I said it earlier, I'm not sure in which segment of the program, but I, you know, I can see the way that they set up Gunther and Seth, and I can see Gunther being able to take care of a guy with a bad leg and look like he's killing him, but at the same time, it will go short by the nature of it, and, and Gunther could win the Royal Rumble, challenge Seth at WrestleMania, and win that title to be able to defend it and give Seth a dragon to slay, a comeback road, a redemption story that he would... Maybe, you know, when he got more serious with Punk is when we started liking Seth. We just don't like the... And the Cesar Romero specials. But uh, at the same time, Cody and Punk, 
is a natural to bubble under Roman and whatever because Cody and Punk have such similar stories they need to finish. Cody and Punk could be a great match, but it could be an epic feud if done yeah. right. They're in each other's way. And and I think they're at a position now where you could really let the people pick their side and each guy could be true to themselves and still not try to castrate anybody with a rusty fishing knife. Just try to get, you know, what they want, you know, past the other guy. Well, we will talk more about Raw, whatever else you watched on Raw a little bit later, but I believe this will end our time travel session here, Jim. We will return to the past. Hold on, let me buckle my seatbelt. All right, I'm ready. Oh, Jim, come on. Oh, hey! Hey, come on. All right. Hey! Yeah, Quit laughing. The doctor told me to wear underwear like that. All right, well, with that, as we get stupider and stupider here, we will go back to the past. We will see you again in the future. <laughs> That's a noisy one, this one. We are in the future, or the past. We are back where we started in the past. <laughs> Returning from the future. And ready for the... Thank you, Emerson, Last, and Palmer, for that transition. You're welcome. What, what'd you do with Greg Lake? What'd you, you throw him off a bridge? Was he near the bowling alley in Columbus, Georgia? I'm not really a Emerson, Lake, and Palmer fan, so I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Oh, come on. Come on, what? You think it's a you're prerequisite? A, I have to not like a them? I'm a fan of Emerson, Lake, and Palmer brain salad surgery. The various psycho babblish hits that they had at a period of time where most of the people under 30 in the United States were on heavy drugs. Amazing group. Well, Jim, you don't need heavy drugs nowadays, but perhaps with all this time travel or perhaps with some of this prog rock, you may get a headache, you may want to lay down, you may need to just feel at ease, at one with ease. At one with ease. Well, I'll tell you, a lot of people have headaches these days in this world, and if you've ever gone out in public and just stared at people wandering down the street, you'll know that most people have a headache because anything that looks like that would have to hurt. But Brian, have you heard about all the the various dangers with the medicines these days, the pharmaceuticals. Have you heard about the stuff that don't work at all? The, the stuff that we found out now is just the placebos, like that cold medicine. They say, well, when they make it like this, it doesn't work at all. Which is why you're always still stopped up and snorty and sniffly and drippy and coffee and pukey. Because it don't work. Or you see the, the, the prescription type medications on TV where, you know, it, it may cure your heartbreak of psoriasis, but it will lead to complete liver disembowelment and projectile anal seepage as a side effect. What? So you, you don't know what to take in this day and age, do you? It's a scary world out there. It's frightening. But I'll tell you what, what you need to do is you need to hit the reset. Reset your health, reset your button. Flick your bean, whatever you do, to make yourself start over again, clean out that medicine cabinet with all that dreck and tripe and snake oil and mumbo jumbo and Dr. Proctor's red rectum rockers, and instead reset your health with CBD from CB Distillery with the clean stuff, the natural stuff, the pure, no fluff, no fillers, no feathers, just pure effective CBD solutions. You know what a solution is, don't you, Brian? That's the answer to a problem, right? You're going to solve that problem. The solve is the root of solution. Well, let me tell you, friends, right now that you've never had bigger problems in your life than you have had right now, but CBD's <laughs> got the solutions from CB Distillery because it's pure and effective, clean ingredients of the highest quality, nature. You almost have Mother Nature coming down and giving you a, a tonguey. Every, every time you take their products, you feel at one 
with the universe. 81% of customers experience more calm. 80% said CBD helped with pain after physical activity. 90% said they sleep better with CBD. And 4% said that CBD makes Tony Khan's booking make sense. No, that 4%, that's a lie. There's no record of that. You've made that up. Well, this is non-clinical surveys, so anything can happen. But if you're struggling with a health concern, let's say you got the crotch rot, you got the shingles, you got the, the mumbo jumbo and the herpes flu. If you haven't found relief, well, then make a change to CB Distillery because at least you're not poisoning yourself. What do you got to lose? You've already got rot in your crotch. So CB Distillery has over 2 million customers. That, that means that well, they can't be just poisoning people right and left. You might as well take a swing at this stuff. And they've got a solid 100% money-back guarantee. If you are still alive, when you ask for your money back, they'll send it to you. And right now, speaking of money, I've got a 20% discount that I'm about to dangle in front of you like a carrot in front of a hungry goat. To get you started on the CBD, all you've got to do is go to cbdistillery.com and use the code JCE for 20% off of your CBD. So actually, you're, you're, you're getting part of a C and then BD. 20% off. It should have five letters, and then we could do that evenly. CBDistillery.com. The code is JCE. 20% off of their fine products. Whatever. You just go crazy. Take everything all at the same time. You can hear colors and see sounds. CBDistillery.com. Code JCE. 20% off. Where in the world are you going to get 20% off of stuff to make you feel good? except on a street corner, I guess, in any inner city in America. But nevertheless, it's hard to get a discount in, under those conditions. You have to make a hurried transaction. Here, you can just go on your computer. Okay, can you, what are you talking about? Can you get back to what you can do here with CB Distillery? Well, yes, you can, you can feel better. You can sleep better. You can have less pain. And you don't have to go downtown on the street corner. And you get 20% <laughs> off. Yes, you do. With CB Distillery and the so promo code. So save gas, save time. The promo code is JCE. Save gas, save time, save money. Save your body. Save the planet. Be all natural. Grow your hair out in your crotch and armpits and commune with nature. No, well, no, that may go against another sponsor, so let's not say that they should grow out there. Uh, I'm just talking about just the women. Once again, CB Distillery promo code JCE. 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 Yes. That's Again, one, two, three, J-C-E. Tom, tell it to. All right. Well, we are back in uh, proper form. Jim? Yes? There's so much to talk about. There's just so, so much. much. I can't so even think much. of any of it. Um, WWE Raw. Do you remember? Have you seen that clip? What? Was it? Oh, my God. It wasn't when they had, uh, in Georgia Championship Wrestling, one season they had Otis Sistrunk uh, from the NFL. He was a big-time football player. He actually wrestled a couple of matches. One season. And then I think it was the following year. The following year, it was, who was the, oh, God damn it, now I've blown the whole story. But who was the big football player? I'm trying to say Ernie Holmes, but he That's was That's what I was boxer. wondering. Was it Ernie Holmes? Was he a football player or a boxer? Hold on. Ernie Holmes. But anyway, they brought him out on Georgia Wrestling. Remember, it's like 1981 or so with Gordon Soley. He did an interview, and whoever the guy was, he went blank and couldn't remember the names of any of the wrestlers he was supposed to talk about. And so he said, well, you, you got, you got, you got there's so many names running through my mind right now. <laughs> And it was funny if I could have told it properly or if you actually saw it. It was Ernie Holmes. He was a football Ernie player. Ernie Holmes. Okay. Well, at the Ernie Holmes, I thought it was a box. That's Larry Holmes. Well, see, I'm all fucked up. <laughs> but yeah, it was Ernie Holmes. And, and Gordon said, well, and certainly you've got a lot of people on your trail. Oh, yeah. Well, I got, you know, I got, I got, there's, there's, 
There's so many names running through my mind. It's a very and Thunderbolt they, Patterson kind of answer. Yeah, and they were they were trying to tell the story, or at least somebody only had told him to try to tell the story, that he wanted to come wrestle for Georgia Wrestling, but for some reason he was being blocked and denied entry. And, you know, I, I think if it had fleshed out, they were going to find out that some of the heels were trying to keep him from getting a license to wrestle or whatever. The, I don't think it got that far. But he just kept saying over there, blocking me. I don't know why, but they're blocking me. I'm getting blocked. I don't know why. He, he couldn't get out. the. He just, I'm blocked. They're blocking. I guess because football. He knew that phrase. It was not a good interview. Speaking of not things not good in yeah. the way of interviews and shows, so this is your show. Where are we going? Uh-huh. Yeah, right there. Yeah, well, at least it'd be peaceful to look up under the under the lights like like diamonds on black velvet, the stars in the sky at night and hear the crickets instead of what we're doing right now. What would you think of Walter Johnson? I didn't think much of Walter Johnson. He wasn't very good. Well, you, he, want, you, uh, want him, you want him to be good, and he's just really not good. <laughs> Well, no, that was the thing. He that experiment, and again for the kids. Walter Johnson was a big time football player in the late seventies, and the Sheik uh, tried to. I don't know how that connection was made, but tried to break him in and and make him a big star. And that was the year that Sheik had gotten TV back on in Cincinnati on Channel Five of all WLW, the most powerful station in the market. But it was at Friday night, Saturday morning from 1.30 to 2.30 a.m. And so you'd sit up at night trying to tickle with your antenna to see Walter Johnson come out and mangle a promo and not wrestle not well. He reminded me of Charlie Cook. Did you ever see Charlie Cook or remember Charlie Cook? I've seen a little bit of Charlie Cook in Florida. Yes, yeah, and he... Right toward the end, I don't know why he got out of the business. I think he was already a little bit older. He kind of started getting it. And he was a big, you know, African-American guy who'd been a former football player, not, a, I don't think, a real high level and, you know, star or anything. But uh, by the time he was in Florida, they, you know, he had fire and he had a little oomph to him on the promos. But we saw him in Tennessee in 1973. He must have been just breaking in, like 72, 73. That had to be his rookie year. And the thing that most stood out about him to me, we'd see him on and off for the first couple of years. This one time on a TV match, apparently, they told him, we're going to throw you over the top rope and didn't tell him how, right, or didn't how to do it. And they fucking, the heel by the referee turns his back and the heel goes and runs him toward the rope and Charlie Cook ran and leaped over it like a fucking hurdle. And then I've never seen anything like, he jumped over the goddamn rope with his legs and, <laughs> and just dropped to the ground outside. <laughs> I've never seen anyone do that. That's amazing. Well, apparently he had never seen anybody fucking get thrown over the top rope. I and, and, and apparently they didn't elaborate. So he's got a hell of a leap. Yeah. Football player, you you get your Wahoo McDaniels, and then sometimes on the other end of the spectrum, you get other things. I didn't know Charlie Cook played football. I think he did. I'm gonna say it, it, at some level. That's why I'm saying I I don't know whether he was a big star or anything, but at least they they gave him. If I'm not misremembering, they gave him that background. Otherwise, he was just a big guy that could fucking jump. All right, well, let's go from the gridiron to the Iron Show. The, Monday the Night steam Raw. iron. The steam <laughs> iron. Monday Night Raw, still on the USA Network until the end of the year. Apparently, they have to figure out what they're going to do between November of 2024 and January of 2025. Okay, well, that's something that we that has come up since we did the what you may have already heard. I don't, I've lost track. Um, and what are they going to be off the air for a couple of months? Is that or they'll find some place to put their show? I mean, it is weird that the Netflix deal begins a couple months after the USA, unless there's a non compete, which I can't imagine. 
Well, it, it, it's that's not long for a non-compete. Right. It's just it's just odd. Um, but I wonder, are they going to? Are they? Do they need that show for that period of time? Or or is it going to be something where there's this all-out publicity blitz and they kind of starve them for their raw? I can't believe I'm saying that. That that won't work. Well, now they've got a year to make it work, Mister Naysayer. Maybe they say, well, we got SmackDown, we got NXT, we're going to launch this big publicity, but they're going to put one of the guys on a bus and drive him across the country and stop every whistle stop. He'll he'll say, remember to get your Netflix, folks. Maybe they'll do that. 1,600 episodes is what they have done when they, when they got to New Orleans on, uh, what was this past Monday, January the 20... Second? Yes. 22nd. 22nd. And we've already talked in the, this program um, that you've heard by now about the Punk and Cody segment, but that was at the 10 o'clock hour. So we, we got to start because there's some other things bubbling around. And the, the opening promo was Seth Franklin Rollins coming out with the knee brace. And where they had, uh, had announced that he was going to reveal what his, you know, what his future holds or whatever, the injury, how bad is it? What's going on? And I think a lot of people were aware of this, even though it just happened the previous week, because they not only sang, whoa, for a while, which they normally do but then there was an organic round of appreciation of a, a, appreciation applause and then a thank you seth chant so and i mean also the, he came out with a knee brace on over his the pants of his caesar romero special but he wasn't like overly limping or on crutches or whatever so unless they knew brian don't you think something was up to begin with they they're tuned into it they wouldn't have gone to that length unless they knew he had some bad news to impart. I think word like that amongst even the casual fans spreads pretty quickly in a building. Seth Rollins is hurt. They're going to start with Rollins. What's this I hear about Rollins? Someone else says something. Well, it's even been on, you know, the, the, it was advertised where, you know, he's got some infirmity that's going on, but a lot of times still with people who just buy tickets and think I'll, I'll go to this as a lark. They're not. When you get to that number, the, the WWE fans are usually in these buildings for the TVs these days. A lot of them are not the internet fans that hang on every word. But they knew about it. And, you know, I got the feeling it, it, this is a big time presentation from this because you could see that Seth was emotional for real because he's like, ah, oh, fuck my knee, you know. I know, you know, how he might feel. Uh, but you can see the tear forming up in his eye, and they get the shots. You know, I just, it, the presentation of it, a star is talking to people that are interested here, and, you know, it, it it's working, uh, as opposed to, and like we talked about with Punk and Cody, as opposed to where it, it seems like they're just talking at them over in AEW these days. Uh, but anyway, Seth, uh, last week, the moonsault against gender, he felt the knee go. He knew something was up in the back, and he was afraid that he might miss mania, and he got the MRI results, and they aren't great, the torn MCL and a partial meniscus tear. But surgery would be three to four months. It sounded like uh, you know, that he was trying to lead the people down the path that you know, he's going to miss mania. And at that point, boom, Gunther music. And he's got some heat now. Have you noticed from the people? And he looks and acts like a main eventer and he's more relaxed now than he was when he moved up to the main roster and he was a little stiffer. He's more condescending and natural. He's getting into this. And, you know, he... 
he put Seth over. He said, I'm going to, I'm going to honestly tell you what I think of you. You're a workhorse champion that everybody can be proud of and blah, blah, blah. Just like me. And Gunther said that he, he's sad to see Seth, you know, like this and might not make WrestleMania. And that's when Seth said, well, you should have let me finish. Because I don't give a damn what the doctors say. I will defend the title at WrestleMania. And I'm going to do everything in my power to walk out world heavyweight champion. So if they're trying to follow the, uh, the, the rules to an extent, a babyface never swears and promises unless he's going to do it. And when I heard that line, when I heard, I will defend the title at WrestleMania, but I'll do everything in my power to walk out as champion. That's why I think they're going to do something where he comes back. He's not a hundred percent Gunther fucking ruins the leg and becomes the champion with Seth having an out and Gunther getting heat for it, which means Gunther has to win the Royal Rumble. You see why I'm, I'm led in that direction like a horse to water, Brian? I do, and I do think actually Gunther is the guy who can legitimize that title. If he has anything like the run he's had with the Intercontinental belt, not even anything against Rollins, but he was the first guy with a made-up belt, and then he had to start pretending like it was the most established, yeah. honorable belt. It's not. Gunther winning it makes it that, if Rollins is hurt, Rollins is hurt. If he can get through a WrestleMania match, you want Gunther beating him as opposed to winning a held-up title. And then, like I said the other day, or uh, in the future, or whatever it was, Hulk Hogan, when he lost to... When, when the Ultimate Warrior beat Hulk Hogan at WrestleMania six, he had to vacate the Intercontinental belt. That way you get the belt off Gunther without him having to lose. There you go. And that's why when Seth said that, Gunther said, I'm glad to hear it, and I admire that, and I'd do the same thing. So from one great champion to another, and he said on Sunday, and then Michael Cole had a goddamn seizure after the thing was over. He said, no, it's Saturday, Saturday, Saturday. But on Sunday, I'm going to win the Royal Rumble and choose you at WrestleMania and target your knee and everything that's not 100% and beat you for the title. So he's actually doing what we've said. Say, yes, I want you hurt and and at a, a, a percentage of your normal self so I can beat you easier. Jesus Christ, it's not that fucking difficult. And then Seth says, well, I appreciate your honesty. Remember who you're coming after, which was kind of weak. Because it's not like he strikes fear in the hearts of children, like, you know, fucking Abdullah the Butcher or whatever. But Gunther then said, you better remember who's coming after you. And that was better. He's so intimidating without even doing anything. He just he has just, that presence. Yeah. The big face and the long fucking arms and legs. And, and the, the voice. Yeah. The voice and adds the voice. to it. And then they they do the shake hands type of thing where I hate you and this is all phony and I'm going to fuck you around when I get the chance. And then suddenly the new day hit the ring and attack Kaiser and Da Vinci and they get in a little bit of a flurry and just go to the break. So that was that, that segment and that, uh, I mean, they're going to have a match when we come back, but before we get into that, um, you know, again, Gunther moving into that level. And it, it, are they going to be serendipitous enough here to make Seth suffering a minor injury actually turn out to be a positive in this story and lead to a, a highly demanded rematch as soon as Seth is 100%. And I like Rollins so much better when he's not hamming it up. I know that's his gimmick, and obviously it's working for him. I hate it. But when he's out there talking and being serious and showing real emotion, yeah, and we didn't really even get to see like real anger or anything here. It was just a real guy having these things. You relate to him, and he's good like that. When he's putting on a fabricated personality, it comes across that way. Fans like singing songs. They'll sing anyone's songs. There are plenty of songs they sing, and then they go silent. Rollins is better than that. He was good here. And Gunther, I said it the other day, he's the best bully 
in wrestling without having to do anything. He's bigger. He's tougher. He's scarier. You know, the big thing down the road is him and Lesnar, if they ever got to do it, because then you have someone. Oh, yeah. I mean, just I can't even imagine him face to face what that would be like. I can imagine Lesnar squashing the other guys because that's their role. But good segment. The re- best. Well, Rollins and Drew McIntyre was really good. They've had a string of really good segments. hate to call them talking segments now, but that's what you got to call them. Confrontation. They're not promos. They're not really building up anything. They're just talking to each other. But this was a great segment. This was a, this was a really good Rollins segment. You know, uh, Gunther is like if Eddie Haskell grew up and became a steroid distributor. Eh? Uh, Can no. you see it? No. 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 Okay. All righty, well, can you see Da Vinci and Kaiser against Kofi and Woods? No, no, no. <laughs> Actually, you should have. And I've, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because, it's you know, and the New Day has just been so preposterous. But they are trying in this match, they're trying to give Da Vinci and Kaiser more credibility. And, and those guys are working their asses off for it. And everybody in this match was going 100 miles an hour and, and not necessarily in a sloppy ways, but in they're working as hard as they fucking can because they, there's new owners, the new TV deals, all this shit going on. Everybody wants to make a good impression with The Office. So all these guys were working hard, but The Office is trying to give the Imperium Stooges more credibility that we've talked about for so long. They can't be the tag team champions and still have, you know, Gunther's single opponent treat them like two job guys, right? They, they, they were trying to make them a feared tag team on their own and then they would flunky for Gunther. <clears throat> it appears like they're trying to make these guys a little bit more serious. And in Kofi Kingston made a heck of a comeback and they did a big four way fight to the floor and did a double count out and continued on. It was it was the arena fight that you see in AEW all the fucking time that looks like shit, except this one, especially for WWE standards, actually had some violence to it. They laid their shit in. They kept it moving. They had game faces on. There was aggression in the fighting. It wasn't just the... I put my hand on your head and you put yours on my head. We're going to walk, fight each other through the fucking crowd like Brody and Abdullah in Japan. It was there. And then they, they got up on an equipment box and Kofi speared them all off through fucking tables to end the, then they didn't get back up. Imagine that they had a bunch of people check on them because they went through tables to a concrete floor and the crowd was chanting, holy shit. And I'll be a son of a bitch. If the audio guy or whoever at USA Network wasn't able to bleep shit and leave the holy every single time. So that, I know again for the Imperium Stooges and Kofi and Woods, normally that's a skipper, but this was, they're trying. I got to give it to them. But you didn't have to give it to I him. Saw the, I saw the spear spot, and I thought it had a little more intensity than usual, obviously. You know, there's certain things that are going to hold me. There are certain things that aren't. I like the talking segments, and I like the matches they build up. Yeah. A lot of these other things just don't resonate with me. There are things I can't turn away from, like some of these women's matches where <laughs> the crowd goes silent. It's well, weird. But- Watching wrestling in a vacuum where like no noise is happening whatsoever. Oh, boy. Oh, it's horrible doing it, too. But no, but that's uh, the reason why I noticed this was because it reminds me of the old days. A new booker came in and suddenly there's a difference in everybody's step in the ring. Or some, you know, also you can tell that whereas Da Vinci and Kaiser were being just completely flunked out back several months ago, now they're letting them do shit and you can see they're responding by trying to do it the best they can. I like to see people progressing. And the Judgment Day, are, everybody's mad at everybody. Rhea and Priest are arguing because Rhea's not happy that Drew is 
or that uh, Priest is fighting Drew, but Priest isn't happy that Rhea's talking to Adam Pierce and Rhea's telling Finn what to do. How long can this go on? And Rhea's dressing more and more sultry. I don't know what you want to call it. She's she's gotten an upgrade in the in the wardrobe department over the last few weeks, definitely. Um, Judgment Day drama. That's the only thing you can call it. And that's a you know, it's good. I I'll see where it's going because it's good when you've got tension in the group and there's you know a couple that can't get along. But if everybody's yelling at everybody, I'm wondering how long they can keep juggling this before somebody gets punched in the face. Did you see Ivy Nile versus Valerie Halla? No. Well, boy, they had a heck of a fucking fight. They were working hard and laying it in, and you could hear a mouse pissing on cotton in the arena. And that's what you're talking about. Where's the crickets? Yeah, that, that sounded like Hogan Slam and Andre compared to what they were getting here in this match. You know, we talk about it with AEW a lot, but you have to be fair, it's WWE too. There's women that belong at the top of the card. Rhea Ripley, Charlotte Flair, Bianca Belair. Becky Lynch has proven herself to be there. If Sasha Banks was there, she's proven herself to be there. There are other people that fans react to. But then there's so many women, and it's almost exclusive to the women where the crowds go silent because they're watching something because it's in front of them not because it's something they wanted to see when they went there women's wrestling will never work if it's just being shoved down the throats of fans that weren't tuning in to see that yes i think women's wrestling deserves a serious well-funded promotion with top flight women and not just filling up TV time with anyone you can get who's a body because they're not ready. I didn't watch this match. The fans were in the building looked like they were watching it, but they didn't want to be there. <laughs> and they, you, they, they dedicate like they so much the TV DMV. time to it. They dedicate so much TV time to it. How much of it is because of the genuine demand for women's wrestling? And how much of it's for other reasons? Are you insinuating that Ivy Nile and Valerie Halla have evidence on some of the higher-ups as to why they were able to get on this television program no i'm insinuating that several years back when there was the big cry for give the divas a chance and then you know get rid of the divas and make them serious and stephanie and triple h were doing interviews about how they're making women the equal to men it was something fantastic for publicity and as a talking point and it's a wonderful idea in a perfect world but the wrestling fans aren't there. You can't just shove an idea down people's throats. And for one reason or another, and there are plenty of reasons, women's wrestling in America was never at the level of popularity as men's wrestling, or of men's wrestling. And nothing changed. They started having more women on the shows, and people wanted to support the women that were on the shows. And again, there's a Rhea Ripley who is as talented a professional wrestler as anyone, man or female. Male or female, I should say. Or person. Whatever is going on out there. <laughs> Any but of the, the genders. But there's way too many that aren't up to snuff. And would it hurt women's wrestling if it was less segments? Less time devoted to these segments? Less women who are not ready being put in these positions? And just a smaller division? made up of talented people that fans care about who can work. It's just, it, it, you don't see it with the men's division so much. Look, when Gargano and Ciampa came out on this show, the crowd was dead silent. That was frightening for them because that's supposed to be a babyface tag team. They didn't re get any reaction at all. But AEW and WWE have women's matches that aren't good, that are sloppy, and that fans don't even react to. They're silent. Or they're just looking at the wedgie that the girl went to the ring with. <laughs> and like, it really has to be addressed at some point. I mean, WWE doesn't have to care because they got all this money coming in. But that's why I said it from the beginning of AEW. Why do they have a women's division? Where's the demand for that? It still isn't there. 
You have like 20 fans that are like, we need the women to be presented better. And I'm like, well, we need them to learn how to fucking wrestle. How about you start with that? Present them better. Well, let, let, let me bring this up. The idea was that in in Japan, when they had the, you know, the breakthroughs, the hot runs with either the the dream the the dream pair, the beauty pair, or the uh, crush gals, or whatever, their teen idol women's wrestling stars over there, that they inspired a bunch of young women to like wrestling and blah blah blah. And they said, well, if we have more women over here on the shows, then we'll get more female fans. When there were almost never any women on wrestling shows, the crowds in some, whether it Carolinas or Dallas in the day of the Von Erichs, whatever, was 50 to 60% female. Now the cards are 50 to 60% female, and there's almost no women in the audience. How does that work? Yeah, that's the thing. You watch any of that all Japan women stuff from the 80s, and some of that stuff's a lot sloppier than it became in the 90s, where really the, the women's wrestlers in Japan in the early 90s, maybe the biggest precursor to the style that a lot of guys work today in AEW or wherever. But in the 80s, you know, Dump Matsumoto versus Chigusa Nagayo was a little sloppy at times. He got away with it because it was like a world class crowd. It was screaming girls, girls who cried. Yeah. When Shigasa got her head shaved. It was a different thing. It was a different audience. That audience has never been there in North America for women's wrestling. Now, no one's really tried it. Glow was a joke. I mean, we could all look back at it now and go, oh, the wonderful 80s. It was never a serious thing. The Genie Bus funded women's of wrestling, or women of wrestling, whatever the hell it is. Women's? The women's the of wrestling. The women's of wrestling. Apparently, the women's do... Pretty good numbers. I mean, they're in a bunch of markets and they're also on Axis. I think they do better than Impact, which Axis owns or the parent company owns. Yeah. And New but you Japan. can't sell tickets to it. But you can't sell tickets and there's no hot audience. There's no people waiting to you can't sell tickets, let alone you can't sell tickets to a bunch of women who want to be invested in it. So who's the audience? Your idea then is you're selling women's wrestling purely to men who are going to come and react how? It's just not there. Like, no one addresses it the right way. No one presents it the right way. And then you get a bunch of these women that show up in AEW, and who's telling them what to do? The agents there? The Chris Jerichos and people like that? It's put all over the TV shows, but there's very little foundation for the presentation and the way it's being done. I'm not saying get rid of women's wrestling. AEW shouldn't have a women's division. If you want to have matches on shows, do that. But you kill your, your own company by having your women's don't, division. Don't get rid of it. Get it under control and make it to where that it will draw money like the WWE have at the top. Uh, it will draw money or don't do it because then why? You haven't seen Dynamite yet, right? I have not. Wendy, watch this Thunder Rosa match. Listen to the audience reaction. And I've liked Thunder Rosa in the past. Watch the actual match. Watch the work in this match. And she's one of the more polished people there. Watch that match. There are so many problems with women's wrestling that people don't really address because everyone's so busy being invested in how much time they get. But then you give them the time and the ratings drop and they're not good in the ring. And the people don't react to anything. It's not the chicken and the egg. It's the fucking chicken in the hen house. It's, 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 the, it's the chick and the egg. I guess so. Well, that's my women's wrestling rant for no reason. Well, we're not quite finished with the women's wrestling because it was the nine o'clock hour and here came Refrigerator Jacks. And why? They have a lot of faith in her, putting her at the top of the hour, but at the same time, this segment lasted three minutes and it wasn't her talking. And by the way, I remember I said, when she speaks, it sounds like somebody has implanted Sable's voice box in a fucking recliner couch. She sounds just like that monotone, memorized delivery. But somebody said, no, no, no. She sounds more like China. Okay, gas chamber or the electric chair. Pick which one. She sounds like both of them at the same time. 
And uh, But anyway, she starts talking, and I don't listen, but suddenly out comes Becky Lynch, and then out comes Bailey, and they got in a fight, and Nia shit-canned Becky over the top rope and leg-dropped Bailey, and it was over in three minutes. So we're going to have to put up with her, I guess, some more. That's the best thing I can say about that. What about you? I can't really say much more than that. Well, at least since it was only 9.03 now. The Rock says. The Rock book says. Book her on that show. You know, couldn't he just, you know, give her a million and keep 29 and. All right. But buy her, they buy went, her a truck? Well, they, they went. Film yourself he, buying her a truck? <laughs> I, thought, I thought you said rent her a truck. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say to move out. But if, but anyway, since that was so quick, they kept the people, I believe, because they went into a rumble package that is one of the things that they do well with all the statistics and highlights through the years. This guy, there have been a thousand, however many people in the Royal Rumble, but only 30 whatever have won it. And this guy had most eliminations and most minutes of whatever. They made it big, and they showed all the twists and turns that can happen. And they did another one later on where they highlighted same thing, different statistics, and some of the the goofy things Kofi Kingston does not to get eliminated, walking on his hands, but the surprise appearances or returns or whatever. They've got... Uh, you know, an annual event that's built around a match. Uh, unfortunately, now it's two matches. Refer to our previous discussion. But they've got an annual event built around a match that has great implications to WrestleMania and has become the, you know, the number two PLE. So, I, I mean, they just keep making it bigger. They, this is showbiz. They know how to get the most out of the, the least. And they've now they've got all this history to work with, I guess what I'm saying. is So they do this shit great. Then we got to see Miz and Dominic. But how much wrestling can we watch on a wrestling program? We got to get to the good stuff, right? What'd you think of the package or do you care? It's good. They always do a good job with these. I'm excited for the Rumble. This is the most excited I've been in a while because there's so many intangibles. There's so many things that could happen. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't even need a single surprise person there to be. Usually it's like that's one of the things. It's like, oh, the Royal Rumble. I can't wait to see who they dig up this year. Yeah. This year it's I can't wait to see what's going to happen when these guys interact in that ring. Yeah, all the regular guys, they don't, I mean, they might have some, but they don't need them. It's always, you know, nice to have somebody that somebody might want, the fans might want to see, but, uh, but yeah, and, and with this one, it's not only who wins the Rumble, but it's how are the other people that don't win the Rumble going to get screwed out of it or screw each other over out of it, if that is indeed proper verbiage. I'm intrigued by Drew McIntyre. We still don't know where that is going. And and we'll find out, won't we? I guess so. This weekend. But anyway, as I said about how much wrestling can we watch, there was Miz and Dominic. Dominic won when Finn helped him and they got more heat and Champa and Same Face came out and made the save. And yeah. No reaction to DIY coming out there. They got the music. They ran out there like baby faces do to make the save. No reaction whatsoever. I know it comes from NXT, but a lot of things got changed from developmental back in my day, including a lot of things that shouldn't have been. So why is DIY not? Why? What does Johnny fucking same face and his wife, Candy LaRue, have on this company or anybody, any individual in it? That they keep using this guy and treat his stuff like it's sacred. Oh, he was DIY. Do it yourself. That sounds like they ought to come out with tool belts. <laughs> right? In in NXT, <laughs> any <of> the, <laughs> right? He was just the he was a yes. famous fucking small, childlike, bland performer in NXT when it wasn't even on national television. But he gets to come right up to the main roster with his own name and all of his history intact and bring his wife, who is the epitome of an indie girl wrestler who looks so out of place and confused with these 
With the other girls, at least. With these other confused at, women. Well, they're, they're <laughs> confused, but at least they're athletes. She's like a goddamn, you know, a target cashier that wandered in. But they use them every chance they get. And I... Uh, but anyway, here's another thing that grinds my gears, Brian. Damien Priest is in the back, part of Judgment Day. He's got a problem with Drew McIntyre, who they're also doing serious stuff with. And suddenly, R-Truth comes in with another fucking ridiculous wad of money that there's no possible way that he could have made selling t-shirts to park. Because who's giving him all these hundreds? How much are these shirts? Has he established yes. a price? No, but, but there's... I know... A two-inch high stack of $100 bills is humming around 20 grand, right? So what the... No, and, <laughs> and they're crisp and they're brand new. And nobody's just handed him $100 bill after $100 bill to God for a T-shirt at a parking lot. Point I'm making is, even if it's the entertainment portion of the program, and nobody's supposed to believe it, which they don't, so they better not be, then after Pree says it's not time for that now and blows him off, he turns and goes into a serious promo about Drew McIntyre, which is like if the professor on Gilligan's Island did a bit with Gilligan and then turned around and told Mr. Howell how he'd come up with his brand new cancer cure and he turned into Dr. House. Right? You can't, you can't go from this foolishness to... Oh, now I'm talking about a main event guy, so I'm deadly serious. Hey, it, it, within 30 seconds, does that work? Doesn't for me. I made a joke the other day. I'm wondering if it's really what they're going to do, that he's not selling any shirts. He's going to his ATM and emptying out his bank account to give these guys money to be their friend. No, but his name is not Tony. It's Truth. Then we got T Chad Truth. Gable and Ivar the Viking. What'd you say? I said T-Truth. No, that's T-Shirt. And R-Truth. And if yes, R-Truth I... sold T-Shirts for $100 a piece in that parking lot, I don't know if he'd get a lot of takers. That's anyway. Right. Well, you mentioned there was a Viking named Ivar. Yes, <laughs> and he wrestled a gable named Chad. <laughs> and then... <laughs> Uh, Raw rolls and, on. And I was looking for a boy named Sue, and Raw steamed on through the Cody entrance and the Cody and CM Punk segment that we have covered previously in our time travels that was newsworthy because it was 17 minutes of gold. So as we've seen again, primarily since this program, we got Seth and Gunther in a heck of a promo or interview segment that made us want to see what's going to go on there. And we got Cody and punk. It makes us want to see what's going to go on there. <laughs> and pretty much in between, we get what we got after Cody and punk, which was Zoe and Shayna versus Indy and candy. And uh, they had this match in a library and nobody was shushed. They didn't need to be. And uh, how can you follow uh, again? <laughs> They don't know who... Dead silent. After they were all screaming. To begin with. They yes, were they all screaming for Punk and Cody. They went dead silent for this match. And they were there. They were just watching. Yes, sort of like, when will this bullshit be over with, as Dusty Rhodes once said? The people sit at home going, this is some bullshit, right? When will this bullshit be over with? Just like that. Just like that. And he was talking about one of the shows he wrote. Anyway, then they had another rumble package, and then we were ready for our main event of the evening, which was Drew McIntyre and Damian Priest. And if you guessed that there was going to be very little to this match and it was all going to be a storyline for the finish, you are correct, sir. Is it, the, it, both these guys are are good because they're big men, but they can move. And... Except, again, Priest is another guy getting really sloppy with these open-handed punches and slapping his leg on the other side and whatever the fuck, but they did good big man shit. Belly-to-belly -belly suplex on the fucking floor, and 
He uh, pre-suplexed Drew onto the desk. They still went to the break two minutes after the bell. And by the time they came, because there was eight minutes of entrances, two minutes of match, and then a break. And then we come back. We've got eight minutes left on the air. Uh, couldn't they have dropped the two-minute girls match? Couldn't they have? Just to give the... But anyway, the only reason they were out there was do this finish. Priest hits a dive to the floor on Drew and Truth comes to ringside at that particular moment to try to give Drew, Pri Drew Priest, to try to give Damian Priest more money. And, and Priest shoves him down on his ass and is like, get out of here. And so Truth is thinking, oh, he must want me to put it in his briefcase. So Priest gets back into the ring and Drew hits a DDT and sets up for the Claymore kick. But Truth jumps up on the apron of the ring at this particular point. Now, bear in mind, we know that our truth has been a wrestler for at least 20 years, so he obviously might realize that this is not the opportune time. But he's asking what the code is for the briefcase. So Drew goes over and punches Truth off the apron. And Priest hits a choke slam on Drew. And he covers him, but the referee is getting Truth out of there. So Priest grabs Truth and shit cans him and turns around into the Claymore kick by Drew. Boom, one, two, three. So we literally, you know, we just got like on the air at least, you know, five or six minutes of a match and then this foolishness of a finish. They're trying to make Drew serious and have him have these dramatic confrontations with people. And there, whatever Priest is going to do, whether he's going to be the one to get fed up with the Judgment Day or become a babyface out of her, whatever, why are they having... Couldn't, couldn't our truth possibly do comedy with Dominic? With it, it wouldn't hurt. Or JD, Funko, or even Finn. But why is our truth being fakely funny doing things that no human being would do when they're trying to make these other guys serious at this point. I do not understand. Well, it hurts Priest more than anyone in terms of seriousness. Yes. And that was and, raw. And that was raw. Boy, was it. No Vaseline. Nothing. Just right in there. Well, I'm trying to transition to anything else, but you made it pretty hard there at the end. Well, that's what she oh said. Oh, boy. Well, that, that's what she said. Jim, maybe yes. what she said is, I need a nice business. Maybe <laughs> what she said is, I need a good online presence, an easy store. For Only people to be able fans. To... Well, no, no, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about to sell product, to sell... Oh, well, that is a product. It is something that the consumers covet, but uh, you mean like a merchandise, like... Uh, Dropship. Knickknacks and pallywax and <coughs> and all those type of things. Oh, tidbits. Tom-tum, tilly-toe, the tidbits <laughs> and the tiddly-winks and the, and the telly-tubbies and whatever you want to sell. You know, if you want to sell something, well, there's somebody that's going to buy it no matter what it is. And... But the selling is the thing, Brian. That's the thing of it. And you got to have your proper online platform in today's high, high internet, high technology, high pressure environment. You got to have the professionals on your side. You can't just do this on your own. You can't just make your own website and just throw shit up there and expect to sell uh, Krugerrands or anything like that. You got to have something you can trust. You got to have a big company behind you using their power, knowledge, and expertise. And that's why that we recommend our friends at Shopify. Not only that, but also they're cheap. And by cheap, I don't well, mean... No, I wouldn't put it that way, no. Well, no, I, I, don't, I don't mean in any way flimsy or lacking in quality. I mean inexpensive. Because I'm fixed to tell people how you can get a $1 a month trial period over at Shopify because they power 10% of all the e-commerce in the United States. And if you want to be one of that 10%, you need to get on the ball. Just go to the e-chamber of e-commerce and check these people out. 
because they're the global force behind all birds and Brooklyn and, and Rafi's. And if they can be the global force behind people who do things like those people. What are you talking about? Well, then that's what it says here. These name brands, they, they're household words, Brooklyn and, and all birds. They, they sell all birds. They've got everything from penguins to fucking pelicans. And everything in between, pink flamingos, don't go to John Waters, go to Allbirds. But nevertheless, that's who Shopify is helping out. <laughs> All if birds? They can sell, <laughs> yeah, if they can sell some molting, shit-ridden fucking birds around the world, they can sell whatever you're trying to pawn off on people. No, if, I mean, well, let's talk about real products well, for real people. Our real audience products. are real people with real businesses, small businesses, and they can use yes. some help. And even Even medium businesses. Because Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout. And, and they can help you from start to finish, from the, hey, let's let's put on a store, kids, to the all the way to I'm retiring with all the money I've made, bilking people out of money on the internet for my substandard merchandise. You don't even have to be good at this. They can sell anything. They're not selling anything. You're selling it. They're the e-commerce friend that you can have to yes. facilitate these wonderful sales. Yes, and they're going to put this stuff up on, on the website, on the internet, on the store platform there, and all your stuff's going to be listed, and people are going to send money for it, and Shopify's going to give you a good portion of that. And, as met, did I mention a dollar a month? Here, I'm going to talk to you about that in a minute, because also Shopify does other things. With Shopify Magic, you can whip up captivating content that converts and generate those instant fact answers that everybody wants. And with Shopify bundles, you can create and sell product bundles with ease. They send you a big thing, a string and some tape, and you just tie around all these bundles of things and you sell the whole bundle at a time. Just move this shit. You sell it by the ton. And with Shopify Collective, you can curate products to sell from the brands you love. You don't have to just sell your own stuff. That's going to ridiculously reduce your overhead, not having to pay for merchandise. Just sell shit that belongs to other people. It's an amazing, not only a time saver, but also... Nope. Well, sell your own things. Sell your it'll own It'll make things. you a lot more money. Don't listen to any... Well, no, it says right here, Shopify Collective. You can curate products to sell from the brands you love. Well, I happen to... I happen to love some of the programs on HBO, so I'm going to sell those DVDs now. No, see, that's illegal. You have no rights to those DVDs. You don't have... Unless you bought them wholesale from the distributor, and you yourself are a vendor well what am i uh, don't i just tell them that i'm curating and it's all okay it's Cur it's the it's the curating law that in, they passed here in, in what way are you curating under the I traditional says, definition of the word curation it says with shopify collective you can curate products to sell from the brands you love giving your customers more variety and your business more sales so if i'm going to oh, sell somebody well. else's shit I'm going to make more money on it because I'm not the one that had it made to begin with. See, these are many of the loopholes that you need professional help to work you through when you're in high commerce and big business and e-business and e-commerce. And right now you can sign up for a $1 a month trial period at shopify.com slash JCE, all lowercase in that JCE, by the way. Go to shopify.com slash JCE. One dollar a month trial period, and if if they like you and you pass all the background checks, they may elect to continue. Otherwise, you'll be out on your ass, but you'll have the experience. Shopify.com/jce, one of the big leaders in the e-commerce business around the world. So that's what you're going to hear a lot of, over and over again. That's right. You'll hear it in your fucking sleep. You'll ask your wife, are we ever going to stop making money? The kids can't sleep. The kids will sleep in very comfortable beds that you will buy with the fine money you'll make selling your products using Shopify. We endorse them. We like them. What's that That's promo right. code one more time? JCE, lowercase. And they'll sleep good in the fine beds you'll buy from our friends at Helix Sleep.
Well, no, no that's I'm, a separate. You can't. That's a separate. You yeah. can't do that here. Can't do that. But let's shop for a question or two before we get out of here. Maybe a song or two. This email was sent to cornydrivethrough at gmail.com from Matthew. No name or town given. <laughs> Hello, gentlemen. I normally don't find out. Wait a minute. Who, who's he addressing? I normally you don't. Me? It's talking to both of us. I don't know why. Gentlemen. I normally don't find out what's happening in Japan except around Wrestle Kingdom. But it painted a very grave image of New Japan. Except for the main event, all of the marquee matches featured AEW talent working in Japan part time or somebody leaving. This is before we knew Okada was leaving. Period. AEW has already signed Robinson, White, Shibata, and Osprey, who seemed to be the plan for when they needed a new top guy. At this point, Tony has most of the people he would have wanted to fly in for Forbidden Door a few years ago. The question is, does this sort of thing tend to happen when promotions partner? Does the bigger company eventually bleed out their partner? Or is this just a product of the new high-budget company entering the market? New Japan had working relationships with every major promotion in the U.S. at one point, and none of them lasted. Fortunately, we have a podcaster who has first-hand experience trying to make a working relationship work. So again, this is talking about New Japan and AEW, but the bigger question, and WWE's being more open about helping promotions that they don't consider competition right now, the question is, do bigger promotions automatically take away the talent and kill the other promotions they work with? Well, it, bigger promotions automatically take away the talent from all promotions, eventually. So the idea is not to have them, you know, to ever taking away your talent. The idea is when you're working with them is to have them take your talent and or give you talent in a, you know, a, a, a fucking smart and level-headed fashion, right? The old story where, you know, Watts would say if he had Waldo Von Erich working for him in fucking Louisiana, and Vince Sr. called and said, well, I want Waldo. He, he was giving him a courtesy call because he's going to pay Waldo twice what, you know, McGurk was paying him at that time, Watts was booking. So, but he was making a courtesy call to the office, and Watts would say, well, of course you can have him on December 1st. And then, you know, Vince Sr. would say, well, here, you get a week on Andre, and he'd draw as much money as Waldo would in three months. That's the way it used to work amongst territories. This has, has a lot of, there's a lot of moving parts in what this question was that you know, Matthew just asked. Number one, it's Tony is being fiscally irresponsible and just booking irresponsible at his own company by signing all these guys at or near the same time period in the same time frame. With, he gets edge and makes him less valuable, right? He's not going to take these people that, yes, for the hardcore audience, it meant something when they came over from for the Forbidden Door show. Well, now there's not even a goddamn revolving door. It's just a wide open archway. Who is Tony's dream talent he's supposed to be bringing in in the future for spots, for shots, for big matches, whatever, to please his dream audience or his hardcore audience when they're all already there and people are going to get sick of him every week because he's going to do the same shit with him he's doing with everybody else, right? So what he's done is he's now, you know, plumbed all the action figure stores in the States for their stock and got what he wants in his collection and now he's raiding the international company because the yen is down and the blah, blah, blah. But he can't use all those people at the same time. He doesn't need them all at the same time because he can't get barely two or three people over in his company right now individually. But if it was, if it were, were the territory days, again, there would be some give and take amongst the promoters, large and small, because, and even with, with me and, the WWF at the time, especially when Jim Ross was 
involved in, in the office, they understood that we were trying to give people the the territory experience as best we could, whether it was in Smoky Mountain or in OVW, so that they would be more valuable to a national television company. You can't go from playing pickup ball in the backyard or in, on the playground to fucking playing in the NBA, that whole story. But when it's a big company that is just signing guys just to have them all, and New Japan is suffering anyway because of the economy and whatever the pandemic damage did to their business, they're getting hit by a number of whammies at the same time. Was there another part of that question that I'm overlooking? Uh, no, I mean, the question was related to the idea of a bigger promotion just taking the talent. I mean, when you lost talent to WWF, even though you had a working relationship with them, was it a case that they were going to take a Chris and Tammy no matter what? No, no they wanted... Here's the thing. How am I going to ever look any of these guys in the eye that are working for me for 100 bucks a night or 150 or whatever say no i, t I told the wwf you can't have them right now i, I still need them i i told vince and jr and bruce whoever was in the positions at the various times that no if you want any of these guys i'm not going to stand in their way but i need a reasonable notice which i always had up until the days when John Laronitis, that <laughs> uh, was in, in talent relations at OVW, and then I got no fucking notice of anything. But it, that had been for years before that. They never yanked anybody away from me uh, in Smoky Mountain Wrestling. It was, you know, these guys, we think we'd like to use these guys or girl. They, we think they're ready to take next step, whatever. I'm not going to fucking say no. I need them for 300 bucks a week in fucking Knoxville. I didn't do that. So, but that was a more modern day thing where it was just, whoosh, 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 and they're gone. Where'd they go? If this is what's going to happen in New Japan and stardom, and if the yen is not going to pick up steam, it makes you wonder if a company like New Japan would try to have a relationship with WWE as opposed to AEW. Because if they're going to lose their talent <laughs> to one company or the other, but also have a working relationship in exchange. Unless WWE wants to go and have a full-time presence in Japan, it's something to think about. Well, and actually, uh, under the previous administration, I would say that'd be the worst thing, New Japan, to give, give uh, the WWE the, the keys to Japan. Here, come on in, we'll help you. We'll, you'll meet people, we'll show you the buildings. Fuck no, and and Anoki or Baba, I believe, would have always kept the American promoters happy and and guests at a distance, right, from their actual business business. Um, but now I don't see why not because with TKO Endeavor, whatever the fuck, UFC's already been to Japan, right? I mean, they were going to Japan before the Fertitas bought the company. It, but I mean, in in modern day, have they they have yeah. done show? Yeah, yeah. So I would think that used that to be a really point, hot MMA market. Yeah. So WWE, they're under the same umbrella. They would probably say, hey, instead of trying to take this fucking country over, because we got enough of the globe to worry about. Let's just partner with New Japan. It's got all the ends, knows everybody, and we'll do some type of big mega show every however often and 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 then leave them to their own devices uh in between i don't see why they wouldn't do that and it it might be good for new japan to get whoever the fuck they're gonna have as top guys not only on mega shows in front of a big crowd but also establish a pipeline look you can be seen by the biggest company in America, this global phenomenon. And that's a, a if they've got to replenish their talent roster, you know, then that's another enticement in that not only could you possibly be a big star for us, but then our partners are the biggest company in the world and you'll be on mega shows. Who the fuck knows?
And WWE uses it as a way to squeeze AEW because of, and that's what they do. They treat every competition, every real competition or fake competition, whatever it may be, <laughs> like something that needs to be crushed. We haven't seen any signs that's going away. I think Tony brings a little bit of the animosity or the feelings upon himself by some of his comments and behavior. But if you wanted to screw them over, you locked them out of this talent by having deals with New Japan and working with some of the smaller companies in the States and someone in Mexico. I mean, it's a new administration. It's a new way of doing things. Yeah, see, the, again, you know, this co Dana White traditionally has not enjoyed or tried to give opportunities to competing MMA promotions, but he's under the same, the umbrella is these Hollywood deal makers and agents and silver tongue devils now. So at this point, they may be, uh, yeah, look, we'll, <clears throat> you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get the, the, the kids down in the summer stock down there in, uh, you know, an impact or whatever, we'll give them a few shots uh, and we'll uh, go and uh, look in Mexico and see if any of those kids might, you know, that type of thing. Yeah. Like Vince putting everyone's shows on all American wrestling. Just want to help yeah. everyone out. I just want to, I want to feature your stuff in my magazine. Let me send my photographer with my business card to your shows. And only. Then you, then you start well, poaching the talent you want. Yeah. But only, only this time they'll be much slicker about it. And, and probably, you know, friendlier it, it, but that's it's it's nothing new but that's the thing that uh tony you know he's he if he collects everything except the stuff that contractually he can't get and then he's stuck with all of them he has no big bombshell he has no big yeah i, I don't know i don't know i think he uh, how many <laughs> remember we counted uh what was it maybe it was almost two years ago now and from what we could estimate based on their website and who we saw every week at their programming, it had like over 150 people on the roster. And you never hear of anybody leaving, but you hear of people coming. And and the people that disappear, a lot of times they're they're hurt, they're still getting paid. So <laughs> there's not many people left. Well, there's not much show left either, Jim. <laughs> With that, the drive through is closed. All right, a very peaceful ending to a very raucous show. You can hear the Jim Cornette experience wherever you find your favorite podcast, probably right away, wherever you find your favorite podcast. Clips on the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel, as well as full episodes and omnibuses. Subscribe today, approaching 400,000 subscribers the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel. Go through the archive, patreon.com slash Cornette. $5 a month gets you access to the archive going back to 2013, over 10 years ago. Patreon.com slash Cornette. Follow Jim on Twitter at the Jim Cornette. Follow me on Twitter at Great Brian Last. The Wrestling News, wherever you find your favorite podcast. And of course, Arcadian Vanguard at Super Podcast or on Facebook, facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. Cornet's collectibles at jimcornet.com. What's going on, Jim? Oh, for heaven's sake, you know very well. Well, just go to jimcornet.com and look at the banners of the Midnight Express and Heavenly Bodies action figure tag team sets and feast your eyes and fantasize. They go on sale February 10th. It's too bad you couldn't make the Dr. Tom Pritchard have like a spring arm that would play with its own hair, but check it out today at jimcornet.com. Of course, the drive through is brought to you by the law office of Stephen Pinu. Let's say 888-877-JIM-WINS-5-O-STEVE. There you go. 877-5-O-STEVE. The law office of Stephen P. New. Get even with Stephen New. Law office .com. But until the experience, right away, and the drive through next week, wherever you find your favorite drive through For Jim Cornette, I'm the great Brian Last. Tally-ho! You know, he changed shampoo and cured that.